All right, so we're gonna start with this one item. And this is something that if you've been following along, oh, I don't know, for the last two plus years, you know that I've talked about this again and again and again and again. And this is the Distress Multi Storage Tin. This is a new storage tin. Now this tin, this is something that has been in the work. So a shout out to Kathy at Ranger for really working with me on this because this was something that started out as one thing and because of the pandemic, because of factory delays, because of all that, it gave us time to just continue to evolve it. Of course, I know that every time I changed something, it just meant it would take longer uh, for the actual product to arrive. But at the end of the day, this one was worth it. So if you're familiar with the Distress Storage line, and I'll go into all of the storage as well, this is a, a hinged clasp lid storage tin. It's got a clear window. Uh, it's stackable, but what's cool about this one is this word right here, multi-storage, and that was kind of the evolution of this. What started out as really being a storage tin for paint kind of turned into other things because as it took time and I started measuring other things around the studio, I'm like, well, hold on, maybe, maybe we can fit this with this, or would this work, or wouldn't it be cool if we can kind of figure out a way uh, to actually store several things. And I think the biggest thing that I struggle with, and I know many of you as makers uh, that have distress struggle with, were these glass bottle reinkers because the glass bottles are different than all the plastic ones. They're very heavy uh, and you don't use them all the time. So you really wanted a place to kind of store them. Some people have little uh, cubbies for them, but that's where this whole thing turned into the multi storage tin. So what this storage tin is, it's a hinge tin that has two inserts. Now, if you're, if you're just starting out and I'm talking about this tin, let me, let me assure you, this isn't the only release for this live. Just letting you know right now, because you might be rolling your eyes going, great, a tin. There's more to it, but I want to start out with this one. So this, when you pop it out, you can kind of see that I like squeeze my, my hands in there. This tin comes with two inserts, and that's what kind of makes it really unique, really cool. Because you, as the maker, get to decide what you want to store in here. Uh, and gives you multiple choices, multi. So we've got an insert that will fit paint and then an insert that will fit the glass reinker. So let me just kind of talk specifically about that. So if you're going to uh, put paints in, you've got that insert in here. These inserts, they are made out of like a, a molded clear plastic. So you could break them. So you don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna crumple them in your hands, but they are flexible. So if you go to remove it, there's little, metal kind of lip if, if you're new to the storage tin world there's a little rolled edge of the metal to keep it from being sharp so when you take this out you kind of have to get your fingers in there and you can you can push it you can kind of squeeze it and and bend it to to pop these pieces out okay because you don't want to stack it in you you're, it's going to be one or the other you have to remember that when you're using this particular storage tin and you look at these two inserts the one with the paint you'll see this one has a lip and this one is cut flush. So those that like to just open their product and see if something's wrong with it, I assure you there's nothing wrong with this. This is by design. There's a short edge and a long edge. Same thing with the other insert uh, on here. When you're working with it, you'll see that this side of the tray has more space than this side, okay? That is all by design because uh, as this tin has to open and close with a hinge, you need that clearance so the lid can pass this product as you go. Also, this front row of product, because it's a plastic insert, you may need to push in this product a little bit to close the lid, or you can pull out on this tin to close the lid, especially uh, for taller things if you're working with uh, this, whole, this whole concept. Now, some people like different things for storage. I happen to love the tins for things because uh, you can stack them because they're rolled. So the paints, you can see on here, this will hold 20 paints. 20 paints that actually go into this insert. So I would uh, pop in my insert. You can just really just push it in there. And these paints just kind of sit in here. What I like about these inserts is that they do hold bottles. So if you don't have one full uh, or if you're working with them, they're not gonna flop all over the place. But as you've seen through the years, because we have been waiting for this tin for a while, uh, I have come up with little alternatives, meaning I've shown paints that fit in the regular Distress ink tin. Uh, this tin, if you, if you took out the insert for this, I think you can fit up to maybe 30 paints that are loose, but there again, you know, when you take them out, they can fall over and all that. It just depends on how you like to store your product. The other benefit to this, as we were kind of going, 
Um, even though this was going to be a paint and a reinker tin, so I'll show you the, the reinkers. Oh, I love this one. Now this one gets heavy, obviously glass reinkers. And, and people ask all the time, like, you know, what makes you decide how many it's gonna fit? Well, it really has to do with weight and what I think that the, the tin could hold. I think that's really important. So what's really great about this concept is that these glass reinkers really fit nice in this tin. This will hold up to, because it's a different insert, it's a smaller bottle, different configuration. This will hold 24 of the glass distress reinkers. If you're looking for something to fit our, or, I'm sorry, the oxide reinkers, that's going to be in the alcohol ink bottle. So your oxide reinkers will actually fit in the alcohol ink tin. And I'll go through the tins, uh, the other tins that are available if you're new to the whole tin concept. So this is how it started out with the multi. We're like, great, two inserts, one for paint, one for distress reinkers. And that ticked the boxes of really what we needed for, for storage. And the other thing to keep in mind with this storage system, and I know, like I said, many people have different studio setups and you have fixtures and furniture and all that. The other thing that's really wonderful about storage tins is if you travel, if you go to classes, uh, if you just go on, on holiday and you like to take product with you, even if you don't store your product in here, which I've explained that in my studio, I have a, a large hardware spinner. That's where my product is stored all the time. But when I'm getting ready for demos or if I needed to take stuff, I love having a tin, at least one tin for each product category so I can just load up my favorite colors and take it with me. Okay, so you can see that this one again is really nice because that insert just keeps all the bottles uh, steady and stable. If you're not familiar with how you can organize reinkers, a shout out to Kabera who did these for me. She actually sent these to me because I talked about in, in one live that I've always wanted to organize my reinkers, but I just haven't had time to, to print it out and punch it out. But all of these, this is all available on Ranger's website. You can go in and actually uh, download and print these circles. It talks about the two circle punches that you need. And yeah, it's a great way to swatch your reinkle labels because it just, it just sits right on the top of that little, that little rubber. Okay, so as we were working through this, get on with it, Holtz. As we were talking about this, a product actually came to market that wasn't on the market when this whole idea started. And just by happenstance, because that just, it just happens sometimes, this little product, these Distress Mica Stains that we've done for Seasonal, and those of you that have been collecting, you know the struggle is real. In pretty much every video, I've come up with a different way uh, to store these little sprays. Now, these are tall. So you can see when I open this, this is where I'll just kind of just gently lift the, the end of the tin. But this insert for the paint happened to be the same size-ish as this small spray bottle. So this isn't for your big spray stains. We have a spray tin, which I'll talk about that. That's for your regular sprays. But this is for the mini. So if you're looking for your mica stains, this will fit. So when I say ish, it is the same insert. But what I found with the sprays, because the sprays have like this rounded uh, kind of clear plastic, different than more of that squared off paint, the paints really sit well in this insert. This, it, it fits well if it's full, but if it's pretty empty, it's, it's almost like the game of perfection where you put one in and one pops out kind of thing, but it does hold them and it holds them really well. And I love the fact that now I have a place for my mica stains, which I know many of you really uh, want that. So when you're working with these, the nice thing about uh, the, the storage is that we can fit 20 mica stains or 20 paints, that's the one insert, or the 24 reinkers, that's the other insert. And again, the multi-storage tin comes with both inserts because it's an, it's an either or thing, okay? Now, of course, if you have all of your stuff stacked, this same thing, uh, swatched. We'll talk about that when you're swatching. Uh, and I, I don't think I'll go into, I won't go into a full demo on this. I've done demos before on this, but remember Ranger sells these swatch labels that are already die cut in uh, large circles, small circles, and rectangles for the ink pads. And that's how all these are, are swatched. They're all done with these label sheets because, well, this label material actually sticks to this. I've tried to get labels from the office supply store and different stickers, and they always peel off of the plastic. This label paper that Ranger does actually comes from the label company that does the labels for their product. It just doesn't have any, any printing on it. So it, it's really nice because they actually work. I've just spent so many years of, you know, doing different labels and they always pop off. Okay. The other great feature, of course, about tins is that they are stackable. So if you have uh, many tins, you can stack them. So if you're putting them on the shelf, you can, you know, do any type of labeling frontwards, 
sideways and I like the fact that they're not gonna all slide all over the place. But if you're new to the world of tins, and we have of course our multi-storage tin, there are other storage tins in the line. This pretty much kind of rounds out the whole storage tin scenario, if you will. As I mentioned, there is a tin for regular sprays. Now regular sprays, because of the bottle, you can see it's taller. So these, tin, these sprays are, are too tall for this tin. That's why you need different tins. And again, it's all about weight. It's all about, you know, how many ounces fit in here, how many ounces fit in here. We want everything to be, well, to actually hold up because if you have a tin that's too big, I've been there, done that, where I've made a tin so big that you can't even pick it up. So this will fit the regular sprays. This will fit spray stains and oxide sprays, the large bottles. That new tin is for the mini sprays. Then we have, as I mentioned, a tin that holds alcohol inks. Now this will hold alcohol inks. This will hold stickles. If you, if you like little glitter glues, your oxide reinkers, anything in kind of that size bottle, uh, this will hold the alcohol ink tin. That's really nice. Then a favorite that people love, one of my favorites is the Distress Ink storage tin. So this is for Distress Ink and or Oxide, those regulation ink pads. Again, if you swatch it, you can have your inks in there. And many people like to store their pads on their sides. If you like to store your pads flat, remember you can just stand it up on the flat side of the tin. So if that's how you want it to store it, you can. Some people like to store their inks upside down. It doesn't really matter, but it's completely up to you uh, when you're working with uh, just, just storing your ink pads. And like I said, this has been kind of the one that's been more of the transformer throughout while we're waiting for the, the multi tin. I've been taking out the inserts and I used to lay my sprays down. It's not as convenient as having everything up so it's just easy, easy to pluck from. And that was the whole insert idea because I do understand that there is a kind of a trade-off. If you, if you have the insert in there, we have this little space. And if you didn't have the insert, you could pack the product in there more. You could probably fit a few bottles. But I like the fact that when I pick something up, my other things don't fall in. So that's really the nice thing, especially if you like to keep things uh, in color order or by season or whatever it is that you, you want to do. That's always important in the storage world. Then we also have some smaller storage tins, and I'll talk about that real quick. We have storage tins that will fit your Distress Minis. So this is the one that fits the, the Minis. And of course, any mini ink pad, any squares you can use there again it's got a little insert at the bottom so you can fit all of your squares i like to keep a flat blending foam under each color so that's really nice the dome foams don't fit these minis but the flat ones do so that, again that's nice for travel because i have them all separated by color but i could mix up a tin if i want if you use archival the mini archival inks there's also a tin for that same thing it's got a little divider in there so mini archival tin that of course is a different size than the mini distress ink tin. So keep that in mind when it comes to, to tins and storage. Then there's another one that I, again, through the years, started out as one thing and we've kind of changed it. So this one, someone asked, can the mini sprays be stored on their side? You can store anything on its side or right side up. It's just up to you as the maker to make sure that if it's a liquid and you're gonna store it on its side, that these are screwed on tight. You know, sometimes when you're spraying, you just don't realize that you know, as you're moving around, you have a tendency to possibly loosen this. So if you loosen it and you store it on its side, it's going to leak, just like alcohol inks. You know, sometimes I've used alcohol ink and I haven't made sure that the cap is on tight and I throw it in the bin and then it leaks everywhere and people go, oh, the cap leaks. I'm like, no, you just didn't put it on. So it is okay to store them sideways. Just make sure that when you're done using them, just give it a, a tight twist, but that also will keep, you know, that pearl from uh, going on the bottom. They all have a flat side to them. So this particular tin, this started out as the crayon tin. So this crayon tin is a deeper uh, hinged tin. I love this one. You've seen me use it for all sorts of things. I love it for crayons. I also love it for the Distress storage jars. So whether you're doing mica, glitter, embellishments, I love it for that. I also love it for cardstock scraps. So anytime I demo, I talk about same tin that I just use it to put all my backgrounds in that I can die cut and all of that. But what a lot of people also don't realize is that if you love distressed watercolor pencils, now they come in their own flat tin and they come, you know, in their own little compartment for colors. But if you use them a lot, and I hope that you do, the great thing about this is that yes, you can fit all of your pencils because it is sized for the pencils to go upright. So you can store it just like you would your crayons if you wanted to put all your pencils, cause I'm a digger. Although this looks nice for the video, 
I like to just dig for my color and, and see what it is. So it is really nice on the crayon tin that it could be used for so many things from crayons to pencils to jars for any type of trinkets to even your backgrounds. And that's really kind of the storage tin thing, the whole lineup of that, okay? But here's the most exciting part for me. And this is probably what, uh, when Mario was talking about how I've been spending my week, yes, okay? Yeah, we've had a busy week. So with this multi-tin, the multi-tin, of course, by having the paint, the mini sprays, the mica stains, and of course, this would fit any of, that, any of those bottles uh, that are that size, and of course, your glass reinkers. Because this tin took, I would say, over two years to kind of, uh, let's see, the Blue Bear said, is that one still called the crayon tin? It depends on if the retailer has updated their site, to be honest. Uh, this initially was called the crayon tin. Now I think it's just called the distress storage tin, but some retailers still call it the crayon tin. So, so back to this one. So on this, because it took such a while and we were only going to launch this tin, I said to Ranger, look, I really don't want to go and do a live of just saying, here's a tin. Although don't get me wrong, this, this first intro, 20 minutes has been fabulous to talk about storage, but I said, can we do something a little bit more exciting? So let me just tell you about what, in my opinion, makes today one of the most exciting days for me. When, oh, we were, when we were working on this tin, because it was all about paint, many of you may or may not know that back in 2021, Ranger retired several colors of Distress Paint. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but this was the first time ever that colors in Distress have been retired in an existing product line. That doesn't mean that product lines have come and gone, like we've had distress markers, they've all been retired as, a, as an entire category. Or we had distress glitter or stickles, that has been retired. Or distress embossing powders, that was retired. Now we have glaze. But paint was the one category where Ranger, and I'm not sure, I, I mean, I do understand, it's because we had so many new products coming out, they needed to make space, but they said, we're gonna retire some colors. Now. Since 2021, there's been many colors of this palette missing. And this is a beautiful palette of paint. I love every single color in the world of Distress because you can see that every color, especially in paint, really has its place. It's super important. So I said to them, would you ever consider bringing back those colors? And the answer was, honestly, no. And I, and I understand that. There's many companies that want something is retired. They just don't want to bring it back. It's just... It's, it's business. And I said, but it would be so great if, if for people that didn't get a chance to buy the colors or again, because Distress has really grown uh, continuously. It's hard to believe that Distress will be 20 years in January. 2004 is when it was launched. So in January, it'll be 20 years for the world of Distress. You know, the world just continues to love Distress products. And I think new color has a lot to do with that. I said, there's many makers that maybe never really knew about paint or got a chance to buy those colors. So would you, would you ever consider? So we talked about it back and forth. We're probably six, six months or so. And here is, here is the compromise that they did. And so I want it, I want you guys to really understand this because I don't want anyone to watch this video uh, a year from now and be like, Ooh, excited and disappointed at the same time. <laughs> okay. So the idea was to bring back 20 colors, 20 retired colors that will fit in this tin for a limited run. So Ranger has already manufactured a single limited run of 20 retired colors and they're bringing them back from the vault. I love that whole term from the vault. It's like they're all they're kept. So these distress paint colors that have been retired since 2021 are now available for a limited time. And this is how they come packaged because I said to Ranger, I'm like, I want it to be no nonsense. I don't want the expense of blister. I actually want it to be a value. And typically paints retail for about $4.49, $4.50 a piece. And I said, so if you don't do all that fancy packaging and cards and all that, they're still shrink wrap. Um, would you do them as a bundle? So these, this is how Ranger is offering them to retailers uh, and consumers. That doesn't mean that a retailer is not gonna buy them, uh, open up these packs because they're just little bags and sell them individually because each bottle is still shrink wrapped. So you might have a retailer that uh, sells them in sets and also sells individual colors. So for example, if you've been you know, missing tumbled glass, hard to believe that was one of the colors that went away. But if you've been missing tumbled glass forever, um, you might wanna get a bottle or two extra. So depending on where you shop, they might offer them both ways. But here's the thing to, to understand about these 20 colors. They are 
such amazing colors. I mean, spun sugar, tattered rose, festive berries, aged mahogany. I mean, these are colors that I know that you guys love as much as I do. Dried marigold, ripe persimmon, rusty hinge. Are you kidding me? Wild honey. Like how those colors ever went away. It, oh. Crushed olive, forest moss, lucky clover, and pine needles. The only blue greens that really exist in the line. Stormy sky, tumbled glass. I've already talked about that. Blueprint sketch and wilted violet. Pumice stone, which I know many people shed quite the tear over. Gathered twigs. I know that was, that's Emma's favorite. Brush corduroy and old paper. One of my favorites and one of Vicky's favorites. So these paints, again, limited time. So what does that mean? It's not even like the seasonal product. It's not like that where they have it for a season. This is... They made X amount and they offered it to retailers and once it's gone, the colors are back in the vault and that's it. Regardless of the, I've already talked about that, regardless of the popularity, the outcry, the emails, none of that matters. But I feel that that was very, very fair of Ranger to do, especially on a product that has gone away. I like the fact that it is it has come out for a limited time. I agree, Michelle, Gather Twigs is a favorite brown because it's that brown between vintage photo and walnut stain. It's really like this, you know, vintage photo has this kind of beautiful reddish hue and then walnut uh, gets a little dark and there's gathered twig. It just sits perfect. See, it doesn't have as much of that red. Yeah, all these paints just have their, <clears throat> they have their place. Especially like when you look at tumble glass, you're like, how do we not have this light blue paint? Anyway, here's the things to know about paint. Paint, especially in the world of distress, uh, is not one of those like everlasting gobstopper products, meaning if you have bottles of paint and they sit on your shelf for five years that go unused, a lot of times your paint will thicken up. Sometimes if you didn't have your, your bottle sealed, uh, your paint could dry up. Most of the time it thickens up. And I'll be honest, I have a couple of colors, especially these highly pigmented ones like Wilted Violet, Blueprint Sketch, Aged Mahogany, that my older bottles, and I'm saying, you know, five years old, when I go to use it, it's almost the consistency of like a toothpaste. Uh, you can thin out these paints with water because they are a water-based paint as long as they're not solidified. The, the thing, and that's why I wanna demo it, is many people don't even understand what makes distress paint distress paint. Some people just think that distress paint is literally acrylic paint with the distress name on it. It is an acrylic paint, but it's a completely different formulation that does things different than other paints on the market and even other paints that Ranger makes. It's not the same as Diane's paint and it's not the same as Dina's paint. It's completely different. And so that's why I wanted to spend really the majority of this live demoing paint so you can see what makes it different. But I'm very excited. Thank you, Ranger, for bringing back these, these 20 colors. These bottles do have kind of this weird little gasket seal uh, on them, you know, one of those little peel off styrofoams. So the upside to that is if you wanted to stock up like don't think that I haven't already because I have. As long as that little seal stays on, your paints really do have a, a longer shelf life of years because of that little styrofoam thing. My whole thing is once you peel off that foam seal and you start using it, that's where air could eventually get into it. But I mean, I've had paints since day one and they are, they're magic, okay? So let's get in and talk about uh, Distress Paint and we'll get into the demo. I'm so excited, so again, uh, these paints, these colors out for a limited time from the vault. And when they're gone, they go back in the vault. And again, I still uh, want to say a shout out to Ranger because I'm very grateful for that opportunity. So let's just go into the colors real quick and, and also get set for our demo. So let me just get my glass mat here. There we go. Uh, what are they, dabber or sponge? They're flip top. They're neither. They're a flip top paint. So I'll show you that when I, when I demo them. Okay, there's our great, our great color. No, I was just kind of moving some, moving some tins out of the way. So I got like a little, little tin stack over here. Okay, so the colors. So I swatched out the colors, the 20 colors that came back, just so you guys can see. And again, we'll get into a demo of, of how they, they work. So the great thing about Distress Paint is it is a water-based acrylic paint, but it has a very fluid viscosity. I wanted a paint when I developed this with Ranger that was pigmented, obviously for a paint, but also very, very fluid. So it has this flow to it that typical acrylic paints don't have. I also wanted this to be water reactive. I wanted it to not have a texture. So it has no fillers in it like acrylic paint would have, like none of that kind of chalky filler. It's, it's a, just really a cool fluid pigment. But the other catch is this is 
the only distress product in the colors that is water reactive when wet, but completely permanent and waterproof when dry. So when we talk about distress, I mean, outside of archival, but that's really the, the palette uh, of ink. But in the world of distress, when we talk about distress inks and oxides and spray stains, a lot of people say, oh, I want to put distress ink on fabric. Uh, can I wash it? No, distress ink will wash out. Well, can I fix it in some way? No, because distress ink is water reactive. But paint, although it's water reactive, as soon as it dries, it is waterproof. So this means you can use it on fabric, it is washable, you can use it on metal, you can use it on wood, you can use it on resin, uh, as in plastic resin or buttons or any kind of embellishments. It's just a great medium. So when we look at these colors, you can see like Tattered Rose, Sponge Sugar, I love Festive Berries, that's really cool. Look at Aged Mahogany, yum. And I'll just go through them real quick. There's a little Dried Marigold, Love Ripe Persimmon. That's such a great retro Halloween color to me. Um, I know we have spice marmalade and I know we even have carved pumpkin, but it's just that weird orange, almost kind of neonish that those plastic pumpkins just reminds me of wild honey. Um, what makes wild honey wild to me is that sometimes it looks like an orange and sometimes it looks like a yellow, depending on what you pair it with. It's almost like a school bus in yellow, uh, rusty hinge. That's really a great one. Crushed olive, a fave because it's just such a great yellow green. Absolutely love it. Forest moss. I mean, come on. That's such a good color. It's such a dirty, dirty green. So good. Lucky Clover and Pine Needles, like I mentioned, both of these are like the blue greens and the fact that they're both gone. Of course we have Rustic Wilderness, but it's a dark, almost kind of a black yellow green. It's not blue like this. Tumble Glass, love it. Stormy Sky, Blueprint Sketch. This always frightens people because they're like, I think it's kind of a purple or a blue. It's like, well, if you put it next to purple, it's clearly blue, but if you put it next to uh, a light blue, yes, it, it could look purple, but that's the whole thing about blueprints, right? They have that weird, uh, that weird color, that weird vibe, which I, I love. And then, of course, Old Paper, a fun color that's kind of a beigey, taupey, mucky color. It's just Old Paper, has all different colors. Brush Corduroy, there's our gathered twigs, love that. And Pumice Stone, Pumice Stone doesn't know what it is because it's not really a gray like Lost Shadow or Hickory Smoke, and it's not really a brown like frayed burlap, it's pumice stone. It's that dirty brownish gray color. And I know that's one of Zoe's favorites. It is a good grunging color, okay? These are swatches just to show, and I'm gonna be demoing this, about what the paint does when it gets wet. If you remember nothing else from this live, it's understanding what makes distress paint different. And that is the fact that it is a water reactive paint, which means you can thin this with water you can add water to it. It is a water-based paint. So if your paint is thicker than you like, thin it out with water. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not gonna break down the color because its core is water. Because what's great about this paint is when it gets wet, it actually marbles. It does what an ink does, creates that cool effect as only distress can. And the best part of this medium is all of these backgrounds are completely permanent. So understand that these are all permanent. So if you did a background with your distress inks or oxide and you created this, you know that if you put something else on it or add more water to it, it would reactivate. It would re-wet. Your colors would muddy. Not with this. This is going to be a permanent layer that we could add to it. So if you're working in journals or on fabric or backgrounds, this paint is just, it is magical because again, it has this crazy cool marbling effect and they all do something different. You don't need any additive, just water but this background is completely permanent. So anything I do to it, I could add another layer, I could stamp on it, I could do more blending, I could flick water, but this base layer, nothing will happen to it. Once it's dry, it is permanent. And I love how all the colors do something different, like Rusty Hinge, mm, magic. Crushed Olive, look at that, Forest Moss. So it's really important to remember that if you use a lot of paint, or if you do a lot of journaling and all that, and you love these colors, once it's gone, it's, it is gone. It's not like, oh, I can go get another bottle of this because, you know, so am I saying to buy two sets of each? I'm not really saying that, but if you love paint, I might be hinting to that because I did the same thing. Knowing that that other sealed bottle, especially because I have some uh, at, that have been in my studio for probably five plus years that have been sealed and they shake up uh, just fine once I open it. Blueprint sketch, love that. Look at Wilted Violet, really good. Uh, little old paper. See, I love, see, it's the perfect color of old paper, right? It's just that it's not white. It's just, uh, I do love brush corduroy. Cool. There, oh, there's our gathered twigs. You can see why it's a favorite. 
because again, it's like walnut stain and vintage photo. And then we have pumice, pumice stone. So those are the colors. Let's get into what this stuff does. <laughs> I saw your comment, Zoe. I'm back. I was shopping. I don't blame you because um, I, I'll be, I don't want to embarrass the guy, but Alan, who's one of the owners of Ranger, uh, I spoke to him just yesterday and he's like, I'm so nervous about this launch. And I go, why? And he goes, because like, you know, we only, we made what we made. And I'm like, look, you don't have a crystal ball. You did what you did. And I appreciate that you did it. So if, if it sells out great, if it doesn't sell out, that's fine. It just gives people more time. But I, I just, I'm happy with what you did because nobody wants to disappoint anybody. But at the same time, you know, you really have to appreciate that they remanufactured 20 colors of, of a retired product. And I absolutely love that. Have you tried using press and seal on the paints before you close the lid? Um, I haven't, and I wouldn't because I use my paints more frequent, but you could try that. Sure. It really has to, to do with as a maker, how often you use a medium. I would say I wouldn't worry about it, but I would say if you haven't used it in like three years, I would give your paints a little run. Okay. So, Let's get on with this. Let's, let's go, let's go. And we'll talk about different backgrounds and, and what we want to do. So first thing, we're just going to do the basics and, and I'll have a lot of samples uh, of different, different things. I've got a whole, a whole list lined up. Surfaces. It really doesn't matter on this one. You know, I always talk about surfaces when it comes to any product and I do a demo of, you know, oh, you need to use this and you need to use this kind of paper and this is going to be the best. This one, it doesn't really matter. Um, because the paint is a water reactive pigment, you'll get something different, I'm sure, depending on your substrate, whether you're working on craft uh, or black or, or mixed media or watercolor paper. But this paint, it, it's not really sensitive to a surface as much. Obviously, if you work on something super porous like wood, you may not have as much playtime as you would on paper. And if you worked on something slick like glossy paper or resin, uh, you'll have more playtime. I would say that it doesn't work well on glass. People ask all the time, can you use it on glass? It's a yes and no. Will it dry on the glass? Yes. Will it bond to the glass? No. Meaning it'll dry on glass, but if you went in with your fingernail, you could scrape it off of the glass because it's not really a glass paint. Glass is not really you know, designed for traditional craft paints. But everything else, your fabric, all that, you don't even need to heat set the fabric or prep it. You can just go for it. But let's talk about the magic of the paints. I think I'm gonna work uh, I'll have all these surfaces aside, but I'll do some tags. I'll also work on watercolor cardstock just on the back. And I'm choosing these two substrates just because uh, both of these like water. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. You want to work with a paper that enjoys getting wet, especially if you're going to wet these paints, because it'll give you more playtime. Okay. So I'm working on the medium mat. I do have my craft mat here. I want a nonstick mat so I can kind of uh, play around with with that color a little bit more, you're gonna want some type of sprayer with water because as I mentioned, these are water reactive and we'll get into different tools. I'm gonna to talk about uh, brushes and brayers and all sorts of things, but first thing first, the basic magic, which is marbling, okay? So I think what I'll do, get my handy little tin, I'm just gonna take these paints out and just work with them all right now because I think that just having them here at the ready, and I have a few other colors off to the side that are that are favorites, but I think I'm just gonna empty the tin and just have my paints off to the side. It'll make this demo go, go much quicker. All right, so Distress Paints, when they first came out, they were in a dabber top. They were in a, a foam dabber. Dabbers were one of those things that I think when, when we launched them with Ranger, it was kind of more trend-based. Foam stamps were all the rage. People were just getting into mixed media, you know, so they loved the, you know, the foam dabber just to kind of go around the edge. And as with anything in, in the creative world, you can outgrow an idea or a, a trend, if you will. And more and more people are comfortable with different mediums. And I didn't really like the dabbers because the dabbers did have a tendency to get a little crusty on the top, even though these don't have any fillers in them. So we changed the flip tops uh, several years ago. If you have the dabber, the distress paint in the dabber top, you can actually buy just replacement flip top caps and you can just unscrew the dabber and then screw on a flip top. But flip tops are the only way that uh, Ranger offers the paints now. Doesn't mean that retailers don't have stock of dabbers, but this is how we uh, work with the paint. What I really love about this is that this paint, I don't know if you can hear it, it does have a mixing ball because it's fluid. Every color in the Distress Paint world has a different viscosity. You need to understand that. Because this is a very fluid paint, 
if it has more pigment, it may not be as, as thin as something else that has less pigment, or if it has some white to it, that's going to be a little bit thicker, but they should all shake. When you, when you shake it up, you should kind of hear that mixing ball, not like an alcohol ink, but just kind of sloshes around. The great thing about the flip top is that it's got that little notch so you can flip it up and it's got a spout to it. That was the other thing I wanted in, in this type of flip top. I know a, a lot of acrylic paint just has that flush top to it, uh, but then you just get a lot of paint buildup. That's not to say that you don't get little, you know, crusty paint that you can pull out, but this doesn't create this giant mess of all this paint flaking down. It's got that little spout. The other thing about that spout, it's got a plug that will plug up that paint. So it really does help keep these bottles uh, fairly airtight, okay? So every time you use a paint, you wanna give it a shake, a shakety shake. And I think I'm gonna start with just a color. And you know what? Just for fun, I'm gonna start with brown. No surprise. We'll do, we'll do gathered twigs just because, okay? So I'm gonna shake this up. I'm gonna flip this open and I'll mix different colors, but just to show you. So this allows me to flip this over and you don't have paint pouring out. You can actually control the flow of drips of your paint. So you see that from that spout, it really does give me uh, the ability to control how much paint is coming out. I like paint this fluid. Many people that just want traditional craft paint, they're like, I don't like these paints, they're too wet. That's totally fine. Then you need to find a paint that you like, but this is something that I developed uh, with the Chemist at Ranger for the purposes that I wanted to use paint for, okay? When I go to do a background, just like if I were to put ink down, I'm going to spray this with water. And you're gonna see just kind of some water uh, beat up a little bit. In fact, I'll just kind of zoom in just a touch there. There we go, you can see some water down here. Now you have some options. If I go into this paint now, it's going to create darker areas where those dots are. I'm okay with that. If you didn't want those dark age spots, if you will, you can mix this up with your finger uh, and then you'll get a, a different flow. And I'll, I'll demo both ways. I'm just gonna take a tag and I'm just gonna start swiping through this paint. When I go in with water, this is where the magic happens. You can see right away that that paint starts to wick. It starts to do all sorts of, of very cool things. Because there is less paint down here, I'll take another tag and just go through this as well. Spray this. And then I'm gonna spray what's left here and I'll take another tag, why not? And I'll just print in this. Okay. So you'll see here with the paint, I don't have them in order. I probably should put them in visual order for you. There we go. How about that? Visual order. First, second, third. So you can see where there's heavy drops of paint, you're gonna get those dark, heavy areas. Once I work through it, you'll get less areas. And even though there's color down because it's an intense pigment, you have that as well. So if you wanna move this paint, what you have to remember working with paint is while it's wet, it is reactive. When it's dry, it's permanent. So typically this area up here, if this was ink, even after it dried, I can spray it with water and the ink would do its own thing, but not paint. So if I want that to, to move, I'm just gonna spray it with water to get it to wick. If I want some reactive things, I'm just gonna add some water drops. See those water drops right there? Creating those reactive properties with the paint, almost like creating little cells. That's all gonna happen while it's wet, but once it dries, it's done. So drying, do you have to heat set it? No, can you heat set it? Yes, it is a heat stable medium. It will not blister like regular acrylic paint. So you can use your heat tool, but I will say, and I've learned this, I, I gotta give props to, to Dina that it, the longer you let a medium air dry, the more it's gonna do its cool little things. So I will say that, you know, if you choose to let these air dry, you're gonna get way more interesting wicking effects from your product than if you were to stop it right now. You could, you could move it, you can get all that flow, but when a medium has a chance to air dry, you just get way more interesting, I think, effects. Anytime you have buildup on the edges, remember, this is a permanent medium. So once this dries, you're, you're not gonna be able to get rid of that. So if you wanted to get rid of those little troughs of sludge, you can just go in with something porous and take that right out. And you'll see that that, that paint just kind of fills in the blanks. But I love so far that one color, three different effects depending on how we work with it. So let's say we wanted this kind of effect, but we, we wanted to do it in our first print. It's another thing that people uh, often wonder is, well, wait a minute, how, 
how do I create that? I'll stick with the same brown right now, but then I'm going to get into colors. I promise I won't, I won't bore you with just grunge. If I put a couple of drips of paint down, so I'll put those two down, I'll spray it with some water. But I know that if I go into those drips, it's going to be this, right? So here, take these and just break up the party. That's all. You can wipe this off. The thing to know about keeping clean with paint, just wipe off while you're, while it's wet. Have a, have a inky binky, a cotton cloth. That's the best thing to do. And while a medium, any kind of medium is wet, wipe it off and then it won't, I mean, it doesn't stain anything. But if it dries on there, then you're going to have to do a little scrubbing. That's on you. So now I'll take a tag. And because we already did kind of that breakup, even though they're intense drips of paint, I'm getting this area, that dark concentration of color, but not the big dark spots, but it, it's also not so wet that I'm not really getting any concentration of color. So that's kind of your in-between option when it comes to paint. You have many, many options. Now you can layer this as well. So let's just take this one. We're gonna dry it with a heat tool and I'll show you uh, what it does. I absolutely love I do agree, I love inky fingers. But what the only thing I don't like is something that changes the texture. You know, like I don't like glue or paste on my fingers because it gets too, <laughs> too sticky, too tactile, drives me crazy. Okay, I'm just gonna dry this with a heat tool. Not crispy dry, but just dry that, see, I don't have a, a, a sheen over it. I just have some wet areas because this will allow me to also build up my layers. So very much like ink, I can go back into this paint. But the big difference is this is going to sit on the top. And I really love how I can control the amount of movement or those little tiny drips of paint and I can build up layers. This is really great, especially if you love to do collage work over things, uh, maybe with collage medium or gel medium, uh, or if you're doing journaling and you don't want things to re-wet, paint is a great foundation because once this is dry and you'll see throughout this demo, we're gonna do some things that really play on that property that you don't have to worry about your background color re-wetting. Now, as we're drying this, you can see there's some of the drips there. If I want to create a different effect, you saw that I dried it just a little bit. I can go in again with a paper towel and I can lift this. And this is going to create the coolest little rings, these little drips. So these were where those paint drips were. But because I started drying it, it dried from the outside in. So a bead of paint, a drip is always going to dry from the outer edge in just like it would evaporate right it's not going to dry from the center so using a heat tool for a few seconds on there creates these great outlines almost like bubbles when you blow bubbles onto a surface and then you can dry it the rest of the way so remember as the maker you totally get to control the effect that you want if you want it dark leave it if you want to create these drips dry it for a little bit just to get an outline so we'll look at this guy so you see how it's got a little bit and we can pick that up and that's just gonna remove whatever wet paint was on that surface. Cool background, so good. Cleaning up from here, again, you can just take a paper towel or anything absorbent. You can even take your cloth and you can just wipe this paint off. The paint won't stick on here and the paint won't stain this because it's still an acrylic paint. But we've got some great options. I'm gonna let these dry. We'll probably bring them in uh, at the end just so you can see the different effects because not everything has to be splotchy in movies. Sometimes you can get a really beautiful foundation of just letting it do its thing. Okay. That's what I really, that's what I really love. Okay. So let me move these off to the side. I'll find a little space over here and I'll pick these up and I'll just move them. I'm just going to let them dry uh, up to the side here. I'll probably put something down. There we go. All right. There we go. There we go. Excellent, we'll move this one over here. Great, so for this, I'm just gonna take my cloth and I'll just wipe it up. Cause that's, that's what has a lot of the water. So now that you understand the whole marbling thing, let's, let's play around with colors because that's where things really get magical. And I did bring in some other favorites because you know, I always say just when there's new stuff, don't forget what's in the toy box, use what you really love. So I'm gonna take some colors, a little pick raspberry. So this is one you can see I've used and used. So this is kind of the only little crusty thing you get with the flip top. Uh, you can you can just peel this off. It, it kind of works as a little paint plug, if you will, but I'm not ever bothered with it. I don't, I don't take them off because to me, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but I'm going to just do a couple of drips of that. Now we'll go into 
want to take a little lighter paint, we'll do a little sponge sugar, do a drip there. I'll take some tumble glass. And when you're shaking these up, I mean, it's still a mixed paint, so it's not like you have to, you know, shakeity, shakeity, shake forever. You just got to give it a little mix. There's a little blueprint sketch. This is going to be, you can tell, it's going to be a nice intense color. I really love how uh, that's going to look. And we'll throw in a little wild honey. Why not? We'll put some wild honey uh, up in this space over here. And I think what I'm going to do now that I'm looking through my lens, I'm going to slide, slide this over a little bit. There you go. This way you can see more of, of the mat there because that's that one's really important. I'm going to take some water, spray it. And you'll see that the paint doesn't really do anything. You might get like a little bit of wicking. It doesn't really do like what ink does, but you can tell that there's water there. I can see the water droplets. This one I'll go into, well, watercolor cardstock. It doesn't really matter whether you want the texture or smooth. It's totally up to you of what you're gonna do with it later. But I'll just start by kind of taking a little print. And I'm not worried about that fact that it looks like paintball because I can go in and react those colors. Just kind of get some movement going move the paper, right? You are the maker, you are the artist. So you can't just will it to move. You can't just look at it and go, oh, I wish it was going over there. Well, put it over there, okay? You can also create movement by just on the glass, just dragging that without going through other medium, pull that movement towards you. So if I would have gone in here, I would have added more color. But if I just wanted to pull those colors in the direction I wanted, I can go right in the glass. You can make a print from that too. Don't know if it's gonna be clean or mucky, but it's completely up to you. The most interesting thing that I find when it comes to working with these paints, and I don't understand the dynamics of it, is that these paints maintain their color integrity. So you just saw one that I swiped through this. So my brain would tell me that these colors should be mixed and muddy, but they're not. They're together. Then you saw me spray it. Then you saw me drag it. So you would think that somewhere, because we have blue and and yellow, we would have green, but we don't. Or that we would have this weird mix of color, uh, but we don't. The colors actually lay on top of each other. Does that mean you can't mix the colors? No, of course you can mix them. You can stir them together to mix a color, but they maintain their color integrity when you are layering them, which is really a great aspect of Distress Paint. So I'm just gonna spray that because anytime I want some something to move before it's drying, I'm just gonna add, add a little water. So even if I splatter it, you can see I'm creating those little cells while it's wet. Once it dries, it is permanent. So let's dry it. Again, do we have to heat set it? No, we're just gonna dry this. Excellent. I see, I see a question, maybe it's been asked many times, because I, when should we use paint versus ink spray? Uh, it really depends. Paint is when you want something permanent or uh, pigment and ink spray is gonna be completely translucent and it creates a totally different background. So I don't think there is an answer to when you should use what medium. It's really understanding what the properties of a medium and then as a maker, you choose when you should use it because ink spray is a translucent colorant and this is a permanent opaque medium. So I do absolutely love uh, just how, look at that background. Super dreamy. So that could be kind of a watercolory background if we want to layer it, which of course I do. I'm going to put a little bit more water down, but because I already have a layer, I want to mix this up. I already know I showed you from the drops. You'll have to choose the creative edit of how you want to kind of work with this. Yeah, I do love the, the different mediums and how they work. So this one, I'm going to kind of be a little choosy as far as dabbing around like where I want to add some color, but then knowing I can go in with my water and just make it part of the background. Again, I could even create some drips see those splatters and pull that color over. But here's where things get really fascinating. And the more you work with a medium, the more comfortable you'll get, you guys, honestly. You, the only way to, to be comfortable with something is to, is to experience it yourself and play with it. But the best part of paint is because I dried that first layer, I knew that when I put this other layer over the top, it would remain that color. So this wild honey is pure, yellow, orange on top of blue. I knew it wouldn't make green. If I were to take these colors together, so if I took a little blueprint sketch and a little wild honey and mixed it, it's gonna make mud. But paint doesn't do that as long as you dry in between because that's gonna be waterproof and you get to put another color over the top. But I love the playfulness of paint and I think that's the thing that people don't understand because when you're working um, 
with a medium, every medium is also going to have a different effect. Like ink doesn't do this. Distress ink does not create this weird little flow over a background with these hard, intense areas. It just doesn't. Ink is going to be translucent. Oxide doesn't do that either. But paint, of course, will. So that's what I was saying at the very beginning of this video. Many people just assume distress paint is like acrylic paint with the word distress over the top of it. And I guess in its basic of terms, that, that could be true. But the beauty of this is the fact that it creates so many cool effects. I'm going to let this one dry completely. We're going to do some techniques where we really need that permanent layer to benefit what we do. Okay. So we'll set that one over there. Um, I still want to, I still want to go in here because I see, I see potential, but I want to go into, uh, to this background and just kind of see what I get. Even that little bit of sludge, I'm, I'm going to be okay with it. See, it's going to be like right there. Be fine. Okay. I'm just going to add a little bit of water to that. Probably most of that's going to go away. Look at that. That's an awesome print. And that's just, I'll call it a cleanup. That's cleanup. And that's something without a brush, without anything. It's just cleanup, letting it do its thing. So speaking of cleanup, if it looks like mud, it will be mud. So that's the other thing to keep in mind, because anytime I, I've taught a class or I do a demo, you know, people say, well, you said that the colors wouldn't muddy up and look what I got. And I'm like, but it looks like mud. If it looks like mud, it will be mud. You can't go into mud and it, all of a sudden everything separates on the paper. So just keep in mind that when your palette looks like something you're not interested in, you want to get rid of it. Don't keep adding more stuff to save a medium. I also see uh, that in the mindset of a maker where they're like, oh, well, there's still good paint. I'm just going to add more. I'm like, But if you didn't like it, you're pretty much wasting that medium to try to save uh, what it is. Look at that. That little space right there. Sweet spot. It's going to be beautiful as a, like to me, I get two different card backgrounds. I get one that's a little bit more colorful and whimsical and I get this one. Now, let's say you just didn't really like this sludge. You could get rid of this one. Uh, someone asked what kind of paper. This particular one was watercolor. The last one was mixed media uh, tags. So this particular one is watercolor because I know that watercolor paper is going to give me more movement with water. So your papers will do different things depending on how you want to uh, incorporate that medium. So that's the basic of marbling. And we can go on and on and on. You could marble in metallics because there's metallics, but we're going to share some of my favorites. And if you watch paint demos, you're going to see some of your favorites in this one too, because, well, I've already explained. I love to repeat myself. It's fun. Next, we'll talk about a tool, brayers. How you apply a medium is always very cool. Brayers are a great tool for uh, gel plates, but also for a lot of different things. And paint is is no exception. These are distress brayers and there's an entire video on just these brayers and what make them different. Some people are still convinced that, you know, a brayer is a brayer is a brayer and I, I say that is not true. But if you have a brayer that works for you, that's all that matters, okay? These brayers, the distress brayer, it is a rubber brayer. It is not a hard rubber brayer like the red ones that Ranger has, but it's also not a soft squishy brayer uh, like a, a printing brayer, like a speedball. This is kind of in between. It comes in two different sizes medium one and kind of a little sports car one. It's easy to clean. You simply push out, remove the roller and you can wash this roller. It does come with little feet. That's where you set your brayer down when you're not using it. I have mine hanging in the studio when I'm not using them, but when I'm working, I set them down on the little kickstands. One, it keeps the medium off of the surface. So maybe you want to pre-ink this and have it set aside. And two, if you always have it setting on its side, you could risk uh, that rubber getting an indentation. It'll come back out, but you risk it kind of doing its own little weird thing. So what I'm going to do with this one is just play around with some colors and let's take, I think I'll take a little bit of ripe persimmon. I do love this color. I'll do a couple of, a couple of drips of that. So when I take a brayer, I'm going to flip it over. So the kickstands are up. I'm going to roll and lift to get some medium on there. Okay. It's, it is important that you roll and lift to coat the brayer. If you push down, you're just going to slide across that medium. It's not going to do anything. See, see how my finger is straining? Just let the brayer do its thing. Coat the brayer so where you have different thicknesses, different bits of paint, and then start applying your medium in different directions. Paint is going to lay down on a substrate different than ink because we, we have that pigment in there that we can utilize to our favor. So again, I'm just going through that and I'm going in different directions. Uh, I am not much for the diagonal, but you do you. So I pretty much kind of stick either you know, horizontal or vertical. Set that down. That's just one layer of color. But look at that. That's like kind of taking a palette knife and doing some, some type of fresco finish. It's just really, 
It's pretty amazing. And we can add layers to this. Let's take a little bit of, I think I'm gonna take a little bit of Tattered Rose. That would be a good one. And we'll add a couple of drips of this one. Now, if I want a totally clean color, I would wipe off my brayer first, but I don't mind if a little bit of this pink uh, goes into that orange. It's not gonna be much. See, I've got a little bit there. And I'm just going to just add a little bit over the top. This is going to layer really nice. Again, I'll hold this up just so you can see. Remember, the beauty of paint is its ability to layer. If you try to put tattered rose over white persimmon, in, ripe persimmon in an ink, it's never going to happen. There's no way it's going to happen because those inks are going to become one. But with paint, you can build your layers. And brayering on paint, it dries very quickly. It still gives you that little bit of movement, but it does dry, it does dry quicker. So if I want to change color, which I do, I'm going to go into some blue. I want my brayer to be clean. So we have some options. Uh, some people like to say spray water and put their brayer through water to clean the brayer. You can do that. Um, I just have a tendency to spray the brayer. I always have my cloth handy and I'll just take this out with the cloth and then just wipe it off quickly. Just makes it, I mean, you have a removable roller for a reason. So see, then I can just wipe that off really quick. To clean clean, you can just wash this with soap and water and then you can clean off any paint residue that you might have on there. Or you can have multiple brayers. You know, many of us have multiple tools so we don't have to clean, especially if you're say working in a journal and you wanna be able to go back to that orange one and you don't wanna to have to clean it. So you might have a couple of brayers. So you have one for your warms and one for your cools so you're not cleaning in between. So for this one, let's add a little bit of tumbled glass. I'm gonna put some of this down. And I'm going to add a little bit of stormy sky as well, because I also wanted to mix that color. So I just put a little drip in there because you can mix these paints. As long as they're wet, see, I can mix it to create a new color. In this one, I'm just like using my brayer to mix, and then I can just roll through it. Easy enough. You can also roll off some of the paint, but it's totally up to you how you want to control it. That's what I love about the craft mat part of it is it because it has a little bit of that tooth, uh, it gives me the ability to mix and glass doesn't, doesn't do that. So here I'm just going to drag some of that again, just pull that color through and create layers. Very cool. Love that effect. I can stamp on this, die cut this, but this just looks like so many cool different uh, effects are done with it. And I think that that's really, that's really good. Uh, I saw a question about gel printing. You can gel print with these paints, but you have to remember it's viscosity. So you have to remember everything I've already said in this video when you go to use it. They will not react on a gel plate uh, the way regular acrylic paints do. They will have a tendency to create more of like a webbing or a crackle effect, which I think is very cool. Uh, but like as that final layer of paint, you're gonna want to stick with something that is, that is a different type of acrylic paint that has more of a filler where this won't. But yes, you can use them on the gel plate. Just remember that they're going to work different because they are different. Distressed paints are, are totally different. So brayering that on, let me clean this off. Easy on my glass. Again, as long as I'm cleaning this off while it's wet, it wipes off really easy with a paper towel. If you ever have paint buildup on anything, whether that's a brush or even the glass, hand sanitizer will take it off. That's gonna make it super, super easy. So. Anytime you have something, you can clean up when it's wet, but it will never be permanent on any of these surfaces. This is designed as a workable surface. So you can clean it with water, or as I mentioned, hand sanitizer. So there's another effect uh, with the brayer. Now, if we wanted to just create uh, a different type of background, let's talk about craft paper. We'll do that same brayer technique and we'll do some other colors. So let me take a little bit of crushed olive. Absolutely love this, really good. And we'll do a few drips of that. It's a fun, fun color. And I'm gonna do a little bit of old paper because that kind of has a greenish hue, so I think it's gonna play really, really nice with this. Okay, so you can, I like this size brayer because of the sports car aspect, meaning this is gonna give me a lot of coverage of a color, but maybe you're working on something bigger, so you might want something bigger, okay? This one, I'm just going to, again, pick up some of that paint, and I like to, you can see on my brayer, I don't like to totally coat it. I like it to be a little wonky because when I, when I brayer the paint down, uh, you'll see that it just, it goes on in different consistencies. If, if you have everything totally covered, then you'll get more of an opacity. And if that's what you want, that's totally fine. 
So same thing, just gonna go on old paper, just gonna start rolling that down. Now, if you have some wet paint, you can work out that paint too, that's another thing. Keep in mind, if you don't like how something went down, so I didn't like how, how overly splotchy this was, you can still work that, that color as long as that paint is wet. And see, we're getting some really cool kind of uh, grungy layers. So now I'm just going over it with a little bit, a little bit more of that straight on crushed olive. We'll break that through, pick on a little bit of old paper. So see, it's all about like how you put that medium on because I know that I'm gonna get a little skippity bit when I have that paint applied that same way. And you just create a background until you're happy with it. Um, I often like that when I'm working on different surfaces, different substrates, you can create some really great effects. I like that, uh, I'm gonna go back and ink this a little bit later, but you'll see that this is gonna create some really cool open space because this one happened to be craft. So it's totally up to you as to what you do with your different, different creations, okay? Can use my paints with Diane. You can use these paints with any paints. These are water-based acrylics, so you can mix them with any other water base. But once you mix this, you're also compromising the property. So it depends on what you wanna do. If you just wanna paint, go ahead, you can mix that. If you wanna create a background and then do some other paints over the top, you can do that as well. So that's really important. Um, yeah, I do, I agree, Mel. I love these on, on craft. So, so good. <clears throat> so I have one crusty brayer and one I keep clean. I, I will admit, I'm, I have one brayer that, you know, for camera, I try to keep the tools clean, but I do like a little buildup on the brayer because I think it, it puts down a different texture, but I know some people get all crazy. So um, I agree, Kay, I don't like colors being retired either. I really don't. It was, as I said, it was just something that like, it stuck with me for a long time and I'm like, but why? We don't do that. And they're like, we had to make room for other things and so, you know, that's the thing about any kind of product. Usually Ranger is really great about having product in the line indefinitely, but you know, at the same time, there's a trade-off. I, I wanted watercolor pencils. So if I, you know, if we had to make room for something, why not be something amazing, right? So there we go. Those are a couple of brayered backgrounds. Now we're gonna talk about lifting. And this is something that uh, I learned from Dina. I'm sure, you know, many people have done paint lifting before, but it's really interesting to understand lifting when it comes to working with paints on different surfaces. I'm going to go back to a tag because it's going to be uh, really quick for this. And you can apply these paints many, many different ways. So I'll start with, I think just doing some, I'll do a kind of a bluish background for this one. So we'll do a little stormy sky. I've got some there. I'm going to throw in, we have to have some other colors. So I'm going to put in some Mermaid Lagoon because I want that. You can see my other paints just get a little crusty. Get rid of that. And I think oh, I'll save peacock feathers for, for a little bit later. So how do we want to paint this on? Gosh, we can do so many different ways. I think for this one, because I've just been doing brayers, I'll use a brush, but you can use a blending tool as well. Um, I'm just going to take a brush. It could be any kind of brush, by the way, any kind of paint brush. It just depends on what you're going for. For this one, because I want this background to be uh, very brush strokey, I'm just going to pick this up and I'm using a collage medium brush because again, it just depends on how you wanna put uh, your paint down onto a substrate. Every tool is gonna to give you a, a different effect. So same thing, just kind of create that little crossover. This, rinse with some water, that's gonna be easy to do. And we're gonna start with just some foundational layers and then we'll start doing some lifting. So while this is wet, I'm just gonna keep, I'm gonna keep building some color. Take a little pine needles, do love this green. I'll pick some of this up. Just gonna mix right into that blue, don't really care. I'm just gonna go off to the side. Just add some. All right, let's take a little bit of wilted violet. Cool. All right, a little bit of purple. A little bit of purple. I do like purple, just a little bit. Bring some of that down. Create just a little, a little cross. You can move that in. Nice effect. Okay. All right, so that's a good foundational background. So my brush, I'm just gonna clean with water. We do have a little jar of water. Just gonna rinse that right off. Again, as long as you clean your tools while they're wet, I'm just gonna squeeze out that, squeeze out that water, no problem. I'm just gonna put this in a safe spot because probably like many of you, it's that one thing that we knock over. It doesn't really matter what else is on our space. 
So clean up. Here's another tip that's important. When you're cleaning up a medium and I talk about it being wet, I know I just used this so I can clean this up because the paint is still wet. If you're in the habit of adding water, I'll just show you. So this, I'll just do half. <laughs> this I was able to just wipe up just going back and forth with the paper towel, correct? If you go in with water because you think water is just going to help you clean it up, you're just making more paint that you have to clean up. Okay? So you don't always have to use water to clean. If you just get in the habit of when you're done with a step or a technique, and I know that this isn't for everybody, but just wipe it up, then you don't have to worry about going in and, and taking anything else, any other cleaners. But if you have a habit of using water, just remember you're probably making more medium. So let's go in and dry this. Perfect. Okay. All right. Nice. Really, really good. So I love this effect, you know, and I'll, I'll go back in with the brayer just to show you uh, the difference in tools. I'm using a heat tool just because I want this layer to dry so I can move on to the next, the next step of this particular background. But you can see that a brush, different than a brayer. And again, I've seen a lot of questions about the brayers. My suggestion is go back and watch that, uh, the video I have on YouTube about the brayers. It's a quick demo, but it does some great comparisons and it does actually show you a side-by-side -side comparison of this brayer with other brayers on the same medium. So again, you may not like what it does, but I, to me, it's the perfect brayer because it's just a, it's a softer rubber uh, than the Ranger one, but it's also not as squishy as a quote soft rubber brayer, okay? So we have a background that is dry and I love also how smooth this is. Now, obviously, uh, if you build up a lot of, of paint, like drip it on or whatever, you could get some texture, but chances are even with all those brush strokes, it's completely smooth because it is a thinner viscosity paint. But this is where things get interesting about understanding distress paint, understanding all the properties of what we do with paint and why we want different mediums. This one is really forgiving because once we have a foundational layer, this layer is permanent. So now we can add other things to this and really create a, a very interesting layered effect. I'm going to bring in uh, some stencils. I went through and kind of uh, purged some stencils that I want to use for this demo and put them on a ring because uh, if I don't, I'll be spending half the time going through, you know, 200 some stencils. So that's also a suggestion. If you have a, a creative time, maybe you're going to be doing some backgrounds for an hour or something, just the night before, whatever, pick out your tools. This way it limits it because you're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes picking out different things that you may want to use. I'll use that one. I think that's good. And I'll do something for a different bit of scale. So maybe we can do these little, these little plus, but we can, we'll play around with these stencils quite a bit. Now I'm just going to grab real quick a foam. I have it in my little, I have a little can hidden now because I, I kind of learned, I learned my lesson. I'm going to take a blending tool just to again sh just show you different tools i'm not showing you different tools because you have to use that specific tool for that technique it's just so you know you have options you can use brushes you can use brayers you can use uh, a blending tool so even on a foam we can use flat or we can use dome it's another way to apply the paint the paint will never harden up on this foam you can wash and reuse these foams even after you use the paints so for this let's add some color and we're going to do some lifting so we started out with a layer of paint. It's dry. We're going to take some other paint. I'm going to take a little bit of picked raspberry because I want something bright, but I want it to not be as neon. So I'm going to do a little bit of mixing with sponge sugar. It's interesting because I haven't had these colors for so long that you just like, okay, that's what I have to do. But now that I have them, I love the fact that I can, I can utilize both. So I'll just take a stencil. I'm going to work in this area here. Could this be done with a brush? Yes, I just wanted to, to use the tool. So I'm gonna just do a little pouncing. Look at that color, love that, mixing it up. And then I'll take that and I'm just gonna go right through this little area and just do some stenciling. So you can see that. That would be, that's the norm, okay? Normal stenciling. What I really like to explain when it comes to processes is that when you have an art medium, you can actually create different effects with the same medium. If you wanted to do a, a print, for example, you can take this paint, we can add a little bit of water just so it makes, makes that a little wetter. We can flip this over and we can monoprint with this. Now you can monoprint with your hand, a, a paper towel, you can even go in with a brayer. A brayer, you might get a little bit of the squish, but that could be cool. 
but because we added a little bit of water to that wet paint, we can get a printed layer. It's never going to be a solid layer, but it's going to be a printed layer and it's paint. So it's also going to act different than ink would. The wetter your paint is, the more drippy it's going to separate, but that's okay. It also kind of helps me just wipe off the stencil. So that's two very basic ways to use a stencil. I think things that we're used to in the ink world, right? But I'm gonna go back to this area and just show you what I'm gonna change it to. And I hope that's still gonna work, but we'll see in a second. I'm going to actually put paint, ah, it'll work. It wasn't totally dry, yay. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna take some paint and I'm going, because that stencil wasn't dry yet, it allowed me to kind of just work it out again. But I'm just gonna place down some paint on this surface just with that blending tool. Now I'm going to take a stencil, place that down. I think I'm gonna go into this like kind of grungy zone. I like that, that place right there. I'll take a paper towel. You can do a paper towel with water. You could do a baby wipe if you want, but it needs to be somewhat damp. And then I'm just going to go in and do what's called lifting. This is what I learned from Dina, which I found so fascinating because you can't do this with distress ink. You can't do this with oxide. And I think in this demo, it's important that I focus on things that make paint unique because obviously it's a colorant. Obviously it's something that's in the distress line, but by dabbing this off with a paper towel, I was able to create the reverse. And because that layer underneath is dry, it did not rewet that. The only thing that came off on this paper towel was my paint color. And that to me is really a cool feature of paint. And we can continue to go in and add layers to this background. We could take a little bit of wild honey. We can add some wild honey. Now let's say I wanted to lift through this area. I'm gonna go like into this zone, meaning I have this background that's dry, but I know this is wet. If you know where you want to lift, just dry it. This is where I loved using a heat tool when it comes to technique, because I'm just gonna dry this section because I want that to be permanent. I don't want it to, to worry about re-wetting with this next layer. Get a little bit of that. There we go, a little paint boogie. And for this one, gosh, I think I'm just gonna apply it with my finger. It doesn't really matter. I mean, that's the whole, that's the, the whole gist that I hope you understand with, with paints. So now I'll take this stencil. I'm gonna place that down. Mm, I do love wild honey for, for that color. Cause like I told you, it depends on what you, what you pair it with. Just sprayed a little bit of water on my paper towel and I'll start lifting. So the thing about lifting is you have to lift while the paint you just applied is wet because once it's dry, it is permanent. Also when you're lifting, I'm going to like different sections of the paper towel. <clears throat> if I stay with just this one spot, I'm essentially like painting with that yellow. So just gonna get a, a little clean area just to try to get that base color as true as possible. And you don't have to lift through the whole thing either. You don't have to, to do all the scrubbing. But now when you see We've got those going to this background, this going through this layer, which also reveals the base layer. It's pretty wild. And you can still feather this out. So as long as that, that base layer right here, that yellow isn't dry, I can still feather it out a little bit. But this is all about paint lifting and building. Super, super easy when it comes to uh, creating some lifting. I did see someone talked about ghosting. Ghosting is when you actually apply a stencil, spray water, and then lift ink with water. That, that's, that is a form of ghosting. This resist is nice because each paint layer is resisting the next. And I think that's quite fascinating uh, when it comes to how different mediums can play because you can do, and I'll even show you how you can work with ink on here. It's very cool when you see how it works. This, always make sure that if you wanna keep your stencils clean, you throw them in water or you spray them with water. There you go, I threw them in water. While that paint is wet, then all you have to do is take it out and dry it off versus scrubbing. Totally up to you. <clears throat> so let's add a little bit of bright green. I'm, I'm kind of throwing some bright colors on here, which I think is gonna be really uh, interesting. Okay, love this one. Little twisted Citron over there. And we know what we know. And that's the other thing to remember when you're playing. When you're playing with a medium, just, just go for it. Just add some different effects. There we go. As you're building up layers, so you're like, okay, I want some, some brush hooky thing. Okay, that's what the brayer's gonna do. That brayer, I'm gonna get rid of that little chunk right there. There we go. 
that brayer is going to give me a whole different layer. But I love that bit of imagery. And the thing about imagery is it doesn't have to be something you focus on. A background is the background. So we really want something that's going to remain the background so we can add a focal piece. It could be an image, it could be a stamp, it could be a collage, it could be something totally different to uh, what you do. Okay, so this one, just going to wipe off my brayer real quick. I'm going to dip it in the water because it's there. <laughs> I have that little bucket of water. I'm like, let me just drip that in there. Okay, so far so good. Let's do one more of that lifting real quick, just with a single design so you you understand the principles of the technique and we'll move on to the next one. Again, anytime I demo, and that's really important for you to understand, I get that I'm probably not using your favorite colors or your favorite designs or uh, maybe even what you have. The point of the demo is understanding the properties of it. And I, I totally appreciate the questions and suggestions, but I hope that it, you're not getting lost on the fact that um, as I'm demoing something, your mind is on to, well, what about this and this and this? And then you miss the whole gist of a technique. Again, I, I don't mind questions. I think questions are what the chat is all about. But as long as you understand the technique of it, I think that even helps you already answer those other questions of what else can you do with it? So let's do a basic again on, on our background so you kind of understand. If you ever find a technique is not working, just try it again. Maybe it's something, you know, maybe you kind of skipped a little step. I've done this when I first learned about paint lifting. Uh, I watched Dina's videos over and over to try to create this effect. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And the truth of the matter was I wasn't putting enough paint down as my base layer. I was trying to, to try to uh, have something reveal that really wasn't there in the first place. So I think that that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be really important. So let's just take something rich. We're going to take aged mahogany. That's going to be good. Okay. I'm going to take a little bit of that. And I think on this one, yeah, my brush is still, still pretty wet. So I'm just going to squeeze out water from that, but I'll, I'll still paint this down. I'm just going to paint a little, I love aged mahogany. I love it, especially at Christmas time. So, you know, that's the other thing to keep in mind when it comes to colors, especially if you, if you have sets or if you know like what you're going to use or what you're not going to use. You might want to make sure that you have enough of your favorites. All right, let's build. I'm going to build up a little bit more in that area. Again, because I have water on my brush, I can see that my paint is going down uh, more fluid like that marbling. That was the other thing I was trying to lift from like a marbled background and it just wasn't really wasn't really working right. So there's my aged mahogany. You can see I got some paint on there. That's good. Put my brush in because I'm going to leave some areas exposed because we do have to incorporate some ink, right? Um, ah, Teresa, thank you. It, paint is, is one of my favorite me. I will say the ink is still my favorite medium, but yeah, I think, you know, like what you do and how it works with, uh, even Dina stuff paint, when you understand it, it's, it's a great medium ink. I, I think just because ink has been my world, but I do love it. Will it emboss without cracking emboss with an embossing folder? Yes, absolutely. It will. Um, it will emboss without cracking. So there's our base layer. You can see it's still a little wet there, but I'm, I'm gonna focus on this spot right here. Let's do a little lifting. We're gonna take a stencil. We're gonna kind of take this one and we'll create a little, little effect. So I think for this one, I'll use some pumice stone. Nice. Okay, <laughs> my favorite medium is what I'm using all the time. I think that's right, Michelle, that would be, that would be the truth. So I'm spraying some of that uh, down. I think I will go in I don't know why, it, I think I'll, I'll go in with a, a blending tool. It just depends. Isn't that weird that certain tools just bring a, a level of comfort for a technique? And even though you saw like you can use a brayer and your fingers and all that. It's something about this that I'm, I like a blending tool just because I can get enough paint down quickly. I think that's the other thing to remember. Uh, when you're doing a technique that you need uh, mediums to stay wet, it is important that you, you work with a tool that's gonna apply that, that foundation. So. I'll place that. I'm gonna go a little bit further over there with some pumice. There we go. Place that down. Have a paper towel that's gonna to take me probably longer to get out of the stack with my fingers than I do paint. Uh, people that really like using baby wipes, go for it. Um, just remember that if you're gonna use a baby wipe for this technique, that the baby wipe is not soaking wet. Also, if you don't have time to, if you don't have an extra hand, you can just dip some water onto the paper towel. Um, 
But just remember, because if your baby wipe is too wet, you, you could risk it kind of seeping underneath the stencil. And so this, I'm, I'm just kind of going with a, a little bit of a, just kind of a dry rub with that. Look at that. Okay. Ah, see, there's some of that water, and that's going to be okay. Let me blot that off. Let me dry it real quick because I don't want it to move anymore. Ah, nice. Nice, nice. Okay. So there's kind of our, that's little paper towel dust you can get rid of. But that's kind of our resist or our ghosting. Here you can see where I had a little bit more water, where I didn't have that extra hand. So that damp cloth, when I'm working, you can pretty much get a paper towel, wring it out to where you get it to what you like. But I'll fix this. I'll stamp over it and ink it. And we're going to work with these backgrounds. Because that's the other thing I want to do for this demo is create some foundation pieces. And then we can go back uh, and work with them. Because I also want you to see the importance of paint with ink. Right? Even though we have uh, mediums, it doesn't mean that you only work with that medium. You want to work with all the stuff that's there. So I'm going to prep something with uh, texture paste because I'll, I'd like to come back in and add some color to it. So let me just see what I have. Um, I, could, I think I'll do this one. This will be fun. Just going to take just a stencil here. I'm going to place a little bit of media grip down take this sheet out. There we go. Yeah, I do agree. I saw a comment, baby wipe has a tendency to catch the stencils. You're absolutely right about that. So I have some media grip. That's going to hold uh, the tag and it's going to grip the stencil a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to work with distress texture paste opaque. So for this one, I just, I want something that I can paint over. Uh, Translucent's going to create a really cool resist, but we, we talked about that in the I think the last live was stampers. So this one, opaque, is very fluffy. Right? Almost like frosting. It's really, really fluffy. Um, this is the one that, this is a new jar, but this is one that, yes, uh, as I use it, I put press and seal in mine to keep my texture paste really fluffy longer. Okay, so I'm just going to apply some texture paste. Here's a funny thing. I'm going to tell you guys this, and you can go back and look at my videos and probably many other makers. I don't know what it is, and maybe you even do it too, so you'll have to pay attention when you're making. Do you ever notice that for whatever reason, all the fingers on your hand, your index finger is like ride em cowboy. It's like, I don't know what it is, why it sits up in the air. Like, I don't know why it doesn't want to do its job. It just doesn't want to be part of the party. Why is that? Like, I never really hold with these. I think just because, I don't know. But if you look in the videos, um, see even that, look. I hold the jar and this one's just like, nope, not having it. I don't know. I noticed that in a lot of my videos and I noticed it in other people. So I think it wasn't just me, but it's like whenever I'm doing something, I always just see that finger. So I, I don't know why, but I'm so conscious of it. Maybe because I've been adding the timestamps. And when I look, I'm like, what is this thing doing? It's just, it doesn't want to be part of the fun. It's like, doesn't want to get in the pool. Anyway, TMI, I get it. So texture paste. We applied it through a stencil, skimmed it off to where I can see the stencil. I'll use my palette knife just to pick that up. This is going to go in the water. That's how that texture paste will just rinse and dissolve right off of that. And now I've got some really great texture for this. Could this be smooth? Yes. If you, if you took your knife or maybe you wanted to work with uh, a larger knife, you can make your texture paste smooth. I just think that texture paste, I like that it's texture. So uh, there you go. So on your media grip, easy to clean off just with some water. That's just going to wipe off. And I'll set that aside. Okay, so we're gonna let this one dry. I don't, I don't like to dry texture paste with a heat tool. It gets too uh, marshmallow fluff. So I'll set this aside and hopefully it'll dry by the time we're, we're done with this. So, all right, or I can give that to Mario. He can, he can put it out in the garage. It'll dry in minutes out there. It's warming up here in Arizona. Thank you. Okay, so that one's gonna dry and we'll, we'll kind of keep going with some other, other things. When we're working with this medium, and we have this, I'm going to bring these other ones in because you guys can see them because they are dry. I just want you to see how glorious these marble, uh, paint marbling have turned out. Remember, we did nothing but paint and water. But do you see what I mean when I, when I talk about marbling? It, it's just the sense that these paints, oh, they're still a little wet there, but you know what? I'm going to take that off because that's going to give me uh, one of those light areas. Ah, uh, see? See that little ring? I knew that that drip was still wet, so I could just dab it off, and now we created that ring. But look at these backgrounds uh, with paint. And what's beautiful about it is it looks like watercolor. It looks like something you do with ink, but this is going to be permanent. So we can 
We can do other things on top of it and we will, but I wanted you to see just how, how beautiful that is. And again, there's no texture to this. It's completely, it looks like it's been printed on there. Fabulous, right? How those colors just maintain their integrity. But like I said, they do something different than ink. This is not a look that you achieve with ink because, well, it's not really what it's meant for. Look at this one as it's drying. Whew. That was that real thick one. See what I mean? See, it's almost like, see, it's almost like granules because we're just letting that paint just dissolve and, and dry and separate. That was one. So that one's still drying. That's two and that's three. Now this one, we'll see when, we'll see at the end, but these areas might stay a little shiny. That's the other thing to know about paint. If you put too much paint on a surface, you might get a little shine, but I think that's going to be okay. Okay, here we go. So next up, we'll talk about uh, working with paint as a, as a medium to like resist stuff. Okay. We already talked about, you know, using paint as lifting cause that's going to resist, but we can also use it with stamps. And this is one of those techniques because I've taught it for many, many years that when people do it, it sometimes it works your first time and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't want you to get frustrated if it doesn't work the first time, because you can always go back and, and do it again and we can try it again. So, um, uh, I'll do this on a couple of tags. I'm going to get some stamps. I think I'll use, we use that alphabet. That's going to be good. We want something that's going to be a background. So I'm just flipping through. This will also be a, oh gosh, there's a couple of good ones. Gosh, hard to choose. These would be good because this is going to be kind of bold. This will be a nice background. Even something like this, I've done this kind of stamp, which would be good. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a resist from our background. Now your resist should be something light. It doesn't have to be white though. You can certainly use a uh, picket fence, white acrylic paint. Obviously that's going to give you the most say drama, if you will, but it doesn't have to be your resist could be something like old paper. It could be something like tumbled glass. It could be a uh, tatter rose, it, but you want it to be a light color. Otherwise it won't look like a resist. It will just look like you stamped in, in a dark uh, color paint. So I think we'll do a uh, picket fence and old paper. So you can see the difference. I think that will be good. And then we're going to take a brayer. A brayer is what's going to apply this to the stamp. I'm going to use a larger brayer because I want to put this onto a stamp. And then I'm, I need my grid blocks. See, I, I said that tomorrow at the beginning. It's right in the top drawer. I said that tomorrow. I go, you know what? It doesn't matter how prepped I am. I'm, there's always going to be part of the live where I say, hey, Mario, can you grab that in the top drawer? Huh? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mario. Uh, oh, I don't know. So grid blocks, I'll just talk to you real quick. They, they come in a set. So they come in a set of all different sizes. That's what I like about them. Uh, it is important if you're going to work with stuff that you choose a block that's going to be best for your stamp. I see this all the time and I'm not judging anyone. So please don't think I'm being, you know, judgy McJudge. But if you have a little stamp and you're trying to stamp with a block bigger than the stamp, you're going to get a lot of wobble. It's even if it's a, a heavier block. And that was also the inspiration for grid blocks. Besides that, I wanted something thin, which I talked about in the Stampers Anonymous Live. But I just like the fact that I can find a block that's going to give me uh, enough place to put my fingers, but also is going to allow me to have good contact. So even though this is a background, I don't want to put it on something this big because when I stamp it, I could get a little bit of a wobble. So, but you do what you have and do what works. But I, I forgot to talk about that in, in the Stampers Live. All right, let's... Let's do this with a, a couple of them. I'm going to take some paint, place some white paint down. And this one for the resist, you can do this on watercolor. You can do this on craft. I just happen to be doing these on uh, the distress heavy stock tags because these are the distress tags. This is mixed media heavy stock. This is the same paper that's in Diane's journals, which I love. And she allowed me to, to have it in my line as well. So I always say thanks, Di. Uh, but it's great paper uh, for a lot of cool techniques. So I want to cover this, cover this brayer. I think my brayer is fairly clean. It looks a little pinkish, but I'll be okay. And then I'm going to brayer this onto my stamp. The reason I want to brayer this onto the stamp versus stamp into it is when you stamp into paint, it has a tendency to kind of uh, push out and move everywhere. So this is just allowing me to, just to kind of get a better, better coating. And, I, and you can go different directions just to make sure that it, it's onto the, on the stamp. But it doesn't have to be perfect. Look at those letters transferred. That's kind of cool. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll stamp a little bit here. Just give it some pressure. Doesn't have to be CPR, just pressure. Peel that off. 
Now, if you're going to do a second stamping, which I am, even if you have some paint on there, my advice is just, just put it back on again because the paint is what's gonna be doing the resist. And so if you don't have it on there, it's really not gonna have anything uh, that's gonna work. So this is what we have so far. You'll kind of see, you guys see that little bit of paint? Okay, we're gonna let that dry or it can, it can dry with a heat tool, either one. I'm gonna clean this stamp off. Again, if you have your cloth, I don't even need to add water. Same rules apply. You know, if I add water, it's just gonna add more paint. Uh, and look, that stamp just came clean, just wiping it off while the paint is wet. So it's not as messy as you think. Some people always think that, you know, certain mediums are, are messier than they, they should be, but honestly, they're not. We're gonna do a, that flourish. So I wanna switch colors of paint. So I'm just gonna wipe this one off. Again, just use a paper towel real quick because I don't wanna have all that white paint uh, on my towel. There we go. And we'll wipe this off. When I'm working at home, cause I, I see a lot of people uh, in the chats when I'm watching where they're like, oh, I wouldn't have wasted that. For the demo, I just like to clean up, but you're right. If, if you're working in your space, put another piece of paper in there, get another stamp or stamp four or five different backgrounds because you have paint out. But when I'm demoing, I just kind of want to get to the next thing. Oh, thanks Mario. Mario brought in a pack of grid blocks. That's what they look like. So yeah, that's that whole set of blocks. Crazy, right? It's, it's amazing. A oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wow. That's really, that's very cool. And then some stamp sets through the years, we've actually brought out different sizes. So this, I don't want to use it on that, even though I have it. You want to find something that's just going to be a better fit for that particular image. Maybe I won't have something that's a better fit. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about that. So this one, I could use this one, but I just think this one is going to give me a wobble right there. Because there's not one that's going to be that perfect size, I just find something that's going to be the next best, which will be this. Now when I go to stamp with it, I'm able to take that and just focus right here and I'll get a better impression. So I've talked about this when we do grid blocks that it's always, once you like learn the way of the grid block, if that, if that even makes sense, um, you'll get it, you'll get it. Okay, so same thing. I'm gonna just load up the, the brayer with some paint. We're gonna put some paint onto that stamp. And I'm very light-handed. You can see that like there really isn't any pressure because you need to lay down that medium uh, on that image, but we don't wanna tap it in. I always wanna do a, an extra swipe here, there. So for this one, I think, I'll, I think I'll go in from the top here. We'll do our first impression again, stamp. So I'm only focusing here. I'm not even putting any pressure on the diving board part of that. Look at that, it's a great stamp. Then we'll pick this up. And the reason I also like to choose different images, what I'm looking for when I'm showcasing a product is that sometimes people think, oh, well, it only works because of, you know, that kind of stamp or that kind of image. And the reality is, it's not true. Um, it's just honestly how you apply most mediums or what tool you use. Because even on something like this with all those details, I mean, that stamp with paint, that stamp with a, an acrylic paint, but I love, I love the detail of distress. So, this we're gonna clean up. Again, take, just clean that off, just using a cloth because that's gonna be the easiest way uh, to achieve that. And off we go. Okay, so far so good. I'm trying to watch the chat. I'm doing my best here, guys. I am, I am. Okay, all right. So far so good, Mario? It's very good. Okay. Yeah, super happy. Okay. It's a, I do like, I like the demo days. I'm like, okay, we're just going to get to talk about this. I'm going to talk about this. And then, um, then we'll be able to kind of move on. Okay. Just wiping this off and I'll get rid of that paint. Everywhere. Well, I like that. I like to have all the tools. I like to have all the tools there. Okay. So here's what we've done. We have stamped two different types of images in paint, one in white, one in old paper. And again, it could be whatever colors uh, you choose. I'm gonna wipe this off. And we wanna make sure that this is going to be dry. So I'll just dry this with a heat tool. Okay. If you get too much paint in the details, my advice would be just to wipe off that stamp with a cloth and brayer it again. That's all. I think it really becomes uh, my, if you've not put paint on a stamp before, 
just take a test drive with your brayer, get comfortable with your brayer, because I think really when, when people are using a brayer, they just, they want this thing to be so loaded. So it's really about like rolling it and kind of rolling it off. You'll see me, I kind of just do that. And it's also about light pressure. If you push down, you're just, you really are pushing so much paint down into the grooves, but you can wipe it off. That's going to be fine. So we want this to be dry. Uh, I just ran my finger over it. It felt a little uh, tacky. So if it feels wet, it's wet. And if it feels dry, it's dry. So, cause the paint does dry completely matte, which I absolutely love. Okay. So, so good. And we don't have to use a heat tool for this. You could let this air dry if you were working, say, in a journal or on different pages or you didn't have a heat tool. The, you can set these aside to dry. All you want to do is just test by taking your finger. It should be totally smooth. If you feel any kind of resistance, it just means that the paint is still, uh, still wet in an area. But see, now this is totally dry. Okay, so now on to the resist. You can use a lot of different mediums as your top coat, but like many things, the more layers you can put down or more color you can put down at a time, the better the effect. So could you do this with ink pads? Yes, you could do this with inks. Um, I've done it with inks before, but because I want to lay down a significant amount of color, I'm going in with sprays because that's because you, you can. That's what it is. I will say for this technique, I prefer a spray stain, so something translucent versus an oxide spray. An oxide spray is going to be opaque on opaque. And so, well, you get it, it will look opaque. So I want to just go in with some spray stains. I've got some different colors here. And because we're going to spray, we'll take a no, splat yeah. box. It's down there on the bottom. <laughs> Did you hear Mario? He's like, now what do you need? He knows me too well. He does. I, uh, I just run out of space. That's, that's the you whole thing. So just going to use a splat box. I'm going to lay a paper towel in there. We'll do some different colors. So this one, let's go a little, little grungy. So we've got, that one is our picket fence. So I'll take a little bit of gathered twigs and we're just going to spray that. Now I always wipe off the nozzle on a cloth. So that's what I have just hanging off uh, of my pants. There's a little pumice stone. So this one's going to be more of a grungy one. Okay. So I just added some spray stains. So see how much color that put down, like a few sprays and boom, off you go. So for this, I want to mix my color. So I don't want to hose this down, but I do want to just splatter some water. So that's where the distress sprayer comes in. I can get that mist or I can slowly squeeze the trigger and see those little like raindrops. That's what I love about this. And that's what's going to give me kind of this striation of color. I can always pick this up. I can move it around. Now, when you first do this, it, it kind of freaks you out a little bit because you place this down and you think, oh no, something, something went wrong. Just wait for the process. You're going to start drawing this. As I'm drawing this, I'm going to do some editing, creative editing, which means any of this ink that's going to build up around the edge, I'll take, it could be the paper towel. It could be anything you want. And I'm just going to edit that line. If you like that line, leave it. You don't have to edit it, but you can see that as it's drying, there is our resist. There is our magic. But when you first spray, you just think, oh my gosh, I did something wrong. I did something wrong. It's like, just take a breath and dry it. Now, again, heat tool is only speeding up this process. I will also tell you though, that if you let this air dry, your resist will not be as prominent. The reason is, is you're giving that ink a lot longer to soak into the paper. So when I'm doing resist, I will say that for this top layer, I do prefer a heat tool only because I can kind of get better results. So right now, that's what we have. Pretty cool. I'm just going to do a little bit of splattering with water because that will break up some of the stain. So you can see I've got some drips of water on here. So I didn't really miss it. I just did some drips. I'll create a quick outline with my heat tool. So much like we learned at the very beginning of this demo with the paint, heating drips creates an outline that when I go and lift, they're more identifiable. They don't necessarily look like, like blobs. They just have more of a splatter. See that? So all those drips are more outlined just for a few seconds of a heat tool because you're outlining it. And obviously the longer you heat it, uh, the less light or translucent these drips become because more ink sits in the paper. But that's a cool background, a very cool background for our resist. And we can stamp on this. We can do all sorts of things because it's done. So there's no embossing. There's no ironing. There's nothing. It's just done with paint. It's just done with paint. Okay. So old paper. 
because I, I just love it. I do love it. I, 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 I'd have to say I should be over the separation anxiety by now because I haven't, but you know, it's one of those things that you haven't, you haven't used one in a long time and it's like, I get to use it again. Yay. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to just go in with some other colors of spray, something a little bit more uh, vivid, a little bit more playful. We'll take some, take a little bit of green. That's going to be good. And I'll even take a little bit of orange, a little rusty hinge. Rusty hinge is good. Yeah. Let's even spray some over there. Okay. So same rules apply. Just going to add a few little drips of water. I don't necessarily want to create mud, but I, I do want to create some movement. So don't think of this as a shake and bake here. Don't shake it up but edit. There we go. I like that little blend of color. I'm just going to get a little bit more uh, moving down. I love that kind of striation of, of those inks. So I'll take this out. I'll set this here and we'll go in and dry this one. Okay. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So that's the whole thing about it. So again, I'm just going to edit that drip because I don't, I'm not one that really likes that dark line. If it's a single color, I'm not bothered, but I think often when it's uh, multiple colors, I am. Okay. See, we can see it's starting to, it's almost like it develops, right? Now I'm going to just create some other, a different kind of texture. If I spray the stain while it's wet, it gives me more of a mottled look. Can you see what it's doing to the ink? It creates more of a mottled look than drippy drops. So drippy drops is going to create that layer little water while it's wet, it's just going to create more modeled movement. Beautiful, beautiful. And the other thing about a heat tool, I just, <laughs> I just saw Mary just said she broke down and placed her order. Well, see that should be happy. I'd place my, ask Mario, when I placed an order, I clap. Like I just did something, like I just accomplished something great. I do. I'm like, yes, I just ordered it. He's like, I've never seen someone so happy to spend money. I'm like, but that means you spend it on yourself. Like that's, that's something to be happy about. But yeah, the heat tool is also another thing because it's different than embossing gun. I've talked about that for my gosh, years. Uh, some people get it. Some people don't, but it, it just allows me to dry a medium and not blow it across the paper. Okay. So here's what we've got so far on this one. And you have some options on this and I do, I love this background. So see that old paper to me, old paper is just more, I don't know. It's more faint than white. And obviously it should be because it's not white. It's more of kind of a, a taupey color, but what I can also do is lift off a color, meaning this is already dry, right? We sprayed it. We dried it. That little part is wet, but that's a little dry. And it, it does have some ink over the surface and you can leave it. If you left it like this, nothing's going to happen to it. It's not going to come off on your fingers or anything unless you, unless you licked it. But by adding some water to the paper towel, you can see this area. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go in this area. And I'm just going to lightly swipe where I have my stamp and you'll see what's happening on the paper towel. What is removing is the ink that is sitting on the paint because the paint is doing what resisting. So even though it shows up, the ink is drying on top of that paint and on both of them, it, it does the same thing. So if you like the subtlety, leave it. If you want it to be more pronounced, you can just go in with a damp cloth and wipe over that stamped image and remove that top layer of ink to reveal it. So there's no right or wrong. It's really up to you if you wanted to, and you can, you can do this. I'm going to leave it like that. I kind of like the half and half because this is an area that maybe I'll put a stamp because my flourish is more faint. And then that looks like another stamp, right? Where I did it. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, hold on, Captain Obvious. Why didn't I just do an inky background and then just stamp and paint? Well, go ahead. You can, but it's going to look like you did an inky background and stamped in paint. Whereas this one has the subtleties of the paint almost moving through the image. And that's why techniques exist because they achieve a specific look. It doesn't mean you can't apply things that way. It just means if you want to have a specific look to something, knowing your creative control, knowing that I can remove it or leave it is very cool. So even on this alpha, if I wanted to just, maybe I don't want to uncover the whole thing. Maybe I just want to wipe some of this off so I can reveal the P kidding. It doesn't exist, but just by dabbing this, now I actually created these little, see these little white highlights, almost like a little neon strip. So you don't see it everywhere. It's still faint over here, but just dabbing a little bit created some of these highlights in the area. So 
you'll see with resist, man, it is super fun because you start kind of creating this whole playful world, this whole playful arena uh, with product. Now with this technique, because I do love this technique, let me grab an image. Let me see if I have an image. Uh, probably not the best one. You know what? That's, <laughs> I already used this one, but that's okay. It'll be fine. You guys will get it. It's not that I want to, it's not that I want to, to torment you with this particular stamp, but I'm going to take floral trims. If you watch the Stampers Anonymous live, um, I did a, a technique with this and craft, but I'll show you that you can do a, a, a similar technique, if you will, uh, over something that you resisted. So I'll take this one. Now for this, I'm going to stamp in Distress Archival. Now Archival is the Ranger formulation of a waterproof ink. If you don't have Archival, just make sure for this step, you're stamping in something that says permanent and waterproof. That's the most important part. So what I will do is I'm just going to ink this up with archival. Tap, 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 tap. I'm going to get a nice, nice impression. I'm not doing the whole stamp. Can you kind of see I'm just working in this little area and I am stamping with black soot just because I love how dark that is. And I'll just going a little bit into the edge with this floral stamp. You could use a stamp tool. You can do kind of all sorts of different things, but I just wanted to share. I love this one too, Rosetta. I really do. So I just created a little bit on the edge just to show you that when I did that craft technique, I'm just going to dry this real quick. You could stamp it two or three times. You could even emboss it. I probably would emboss it with black, then it would really stand out, but you'll, you'll get the gist of this technique. Uh, but in stampers, I, actually took craft stock, did that little brown ink, and I talked about lifting, and in this case, ghosting. Yes, ghosting like uh, Diane does, where you're taking water and you're removing color. We can do the same thing with this because our background is done in a spray stain. So what we can do is go in with that wet brush, and I've shown this technique many, many times, but now I'm going over that stain, take the paper towel and lift that color. So we can do that kind of reverse faux bleaching, if you will, uh, over any type of inked background. The difference with the technique that I showed last week was that the, the background color was already done from the craft stock, which I thought was very, very cool. It was a fun uh, way to, to play off of that paper. But this one, we're just lifting the ink color that we did just to kind of create a highlight. And you can go over this as many times as you want, obviously, depending on how much ink is down, you'll see in this area, see where I have a lot of ink. You may want to go in a second or third time because distress ink is always going to be reactive with water. So see how I'm able to lift it. But now when we get down here, this is where things are, are fun because now I can remove the ink color, but my stamped resist that flourish is not going anywhere. That's not going to be distorted. That flourish will remain in there because that's going to be permanent, but quite fun, quite, quite beautiful just to kind of learn. And I, I love the serendipitous uh, opportunities when I'm showing a technique, say the previous week. And then I just want, I'm like, Oh, Hey, I can, cause a lot of people said, well, if I don't have craft stock, you know, how do I achieve that? And it just depends. It depends on obviously the paper because this particular paper mixed media is designed to give color back. This may not work with everything else, but look at that. So before you didn't really see that flower and now you do. And you could do the whole thing, but I don't want to. I, I think it's a beautiful addition to this background. We've got flourishes, but that one's the faint one that's underneath. You've got a beautiful flower that we kind of did faux bleaching and we've got this swirl. Now tags, I talk about this in every demo. Please just remember, get over yourself with tags. And I mean that with love because getting over yourself is the best thing you can do for your creative mind. Get over that it's a tag. This is a card front. I cut this off and this goes on a card. This could go on a card this way, this way, it could be two, but this is such a great size to play with. If you, if you looked in my studio, I would have more packs of these tags. And this is not the same as an office tag. Um, I'm just telling you now how the paper works. It's not as yellow. It has that perfect kind of beige tone, but this is why you see me do tags 90% of the time in my demo. It's quick, it's easy to fill, but it is always the perfect size, especially if you are a card maker, even in journals or ATCs, it's that perfect foundation. So get over that. There's a, a hole here, cut it off. And now it's a panel, but it also kind of always gives you something to hold on to 
when you're doing backgrounds as well. So if you kind of start embracing that, it's way easier to do because even though we do sometimes big panels, most of the time I'll cut them down for cards anyway. So that saves a step, but that's, it's always great advice to have. It's not, okay. After all, so you far, are so the good. Main or <laughs> I have been called that, and that that wasn't that wasn't said with love, but it was still funny, <laughs> because I always used tags back in the days, and we even did twelve tags. It's like, who is this guy? Like the mayor of Tagtown? But <laughs> but it, but then he ended up using tags, which is kind of funny. I think that's great. It's like, oh, actually, tags are now I kind of get what this whole jam was about. All right, so you guys understand the cool thing about resist, and this one we could stamp on it. Yeah, let's stamp on that too, just to to show you when we're working on it. I've got, you have got stuff I, everywhere. I do. I have, every time I pick up something, it's like I discover a new pile underneath. I'm like, oh, there it is. Okay. Let's take this guy. He, he's going to be fun. Uh, hey, Mario, what do you need? <laughs> can you grab me my stamp platform? It's under, it's oh, under yeah. that third drawer on the right. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is, this is the reality around here. It's, it's just how it is. Um, yeah. I do. I like that. I'll, I'll just take the regular. I'll take the, yeah. Well, actually, I'll do the mini. <laughs> the travel. I was going to, I don't have space. I was going to do that. I agree, Zoe. I need a bigger table. You need the bigger space. Well, because I, I do. I stand in front of the window and that's, that's my space. But because I'm going to stamp with uh, archival, I, I do like to work on something that is going to give me a little opportunity to maybe stamp more than once. And this guy, can you see? Like, haven't even used him yet. It's going to be good because I knew so many makers were using him. I kind of held off. So I'm going to do like a little, little split screen on him. He'll, he'll be fun that way. So I'm going to place that down. I do have a piece of media grip that, that kind of helps me. Let's see, we make sure. Yep. Rubber stamp. So remember also, if you have one of these rubber and clear, make sure you're using the right side. I've got to clear out these paints so I can ink this up. Okay. Going in. The little archival. I, you need to see. Did you see that? Oh, it was over here, hanging up again. Okay, now it's put to use. I normally have the the case under there. I have this sitting under there, but I have space for it because I have that little tappity tap. Okay, ink it up. Now again, uh, push into the hinge so you can engage like where that's going to be. We're gonna press down. Okay, okay. we're gonna sir. lift that up. Be, yeah. A bigger table? Call art. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Art could totally do it. But it's it's just for yeah, I think it's it's just for the sake of that. So when I'm inking this, you want to make sure that you're inking like really just really heavy. Okay? Because I am stamping over, after all, a very grungy, grungy background. Okay. Stamp with purpose. Ah, build that layer up. See? That one, that's what it needed. It needed that second layer. So I'm just going to wipe off the archival while it's clean. This is also known as priming your stamp. I that's exactly how I put the stamp away. I think they stamp better. That's why that first time I didn't think it stamped really good at all because it was a new, a new stamp for that. And then I think I'll just do a little bit of, I think I'll just do this little dial. Yeah, I do. I think I want that dial over there. So let's take these off. Remember they're prize fighters, so keep them in their corner. Uh, archival on the media grip, you can just wipe it off. You can always wash this media grip. So I'm just gonna move my tag uh, over, and pick these up, and I'm just gonna pick the part of the dial that I want. It doesn't always have to be uh, upright. You also wanna make sure that whenever you're you know, working with backgrounds, that you give yourself some, some space, some landing space, okay, if you will. I'm gonna push down. Landing space meaning, you know, when I was stamping that, I didn't fill up the whole background with that resist. You could, but again, see, that's that first generation of a new stamp. Mm -mm. No, 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 nope. Gonna do a second. Oh my gosh, that's how it is. Okay, push down and stamp. There we go, okay. Happy with that. Let's take this stamp off, give it a good, good clean. See, now that's ready to go. Now it will, it, now it's going to stamp beautifully from here on out because it's a little primed. And most of the time, that's what I do with the stamps. Okay, we're going to take this off. I'm going to wipe this. I'm just going to add a little bit of water to that media grip. I have media grip just because it, it does allow a lot more flexibility, but I also like that it's not a sticky mat so I can clean it indefinitely. Look at that. Perfect. 
perfect, perfect. Okay, let's. I'll give you this. Sure. Yeah, Mario's like, sure, I take, put back. Okay, here's what we have right now. So we've got a stamped image. Now, you you have some options. Again, we know that if we wanna see this more, we can just go in and lift just like we did the flower. So that's what I think I'm going to do. I think I'll just lift a little bit of that area. So I'm just gonna dry this off just to make that ink, make sure that that ink is permanent and do a little bit of lifting. Once you start figuring out the, the techniques, if you will, sometimes you'll see something and what's really important for, for me to remind people of is, is just about connecting the dots, okay? It's, it's so many things. Often, I think maybe some people are so used to being entertained in the aspect of, you know, everything they see needs to be, you know, wow, game changer, never before, you know, that's not necessarily the case. It's if you understand the fundamentals of a product, a product, I'm telling you, what a product does and how it reacts, you could easily connect the dots in your creative world. So you might see a technique where they're like, oh my gosh, look at this, this technique is amazing. But the reality of it, and that's what I said even last week is, well, duh, of course. Of course, if I went over distress ink with water, it's gonna lift. That's what distress ink does. But you may not necessarily have connected the dots because you, you just think, well, this is what I do with distress ink. And I hope that these demos help you just navigate your creative tools and really get more use out of it. So see, I'm just going in, lightening this up just to make that not blend into the background as much and just in that face area. I think that's just, that's cool. And we could add other colors. We can do so many things, but that is uh, stamp resist and then also doing a little bit of, of faux bleaching, okay? So far, so good. Moving on. Ooh, this one's turning out so good. Uh, I just I just looked over and I need to like see how that's coming. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So next we'll talk about just doing some some other type of inking. And I think what I'll do is let's do this one. So remember this one. This was one that we did with paint uh, and a brayer over craft. Let's see what happens when we add some ink over it. So I'm gonna take a little bit of Distress. So take some walnut stain. I'm gonna place a little bit of media grip down so my ink pad stays. Would you mind grabbing me a domed foam right there? It's on the top of that spinner to the left of that empty tool. Look over, there you go, that guy. Thanks, yep, thank you. Perfect, give me a brown one, okay. I could use a flat, but you know, like domed foam, just wanna use domed foam. So here, I'm just gonna take some Distress and I'm gonna blend over this. I just wanna see what happens. We know we have some color down and just getting off the back of Stamped Resist, I want you, do you see? I just wanna show you, I think it yeah, just doesn't wanna get inky, um, that it doesn't always have to be about a stamp. It's about paint working as, as a resist. Yes, you can cut the media grip with the rotary trimmer. You can cut that media grip up. There we go, some ink. But because we know that paint is a resist, and we know that we brayered on different colors. We did a little, I think that was crushed olive in old paper. I'm gonna take a little bit of water and I'm just gonna wipe this. Oh, that's what we want. Look at that, there's our color back. There's our crushed olive in old paper. So see, when you first ink it, you're like, no, 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 the color's gone. Yeah, it would have been gone if you, if you left it, but just like that stamp resist. So this is one of those things I was just mentioning that you see a technique on something else where it's like, oh, Look, the paint works as a resist when you stamp it. No, the paint works as a resist, period. When you stamp it, when you stencil it, when you brayer it, paint is a resist, period, okay? An ink pad, it works with an ink pad, you can see that. It's just a different, softer, blended look, but do you see wherever the craft was exposed, so wherever this paper was exposed, that ink was able to permeate and color and makes for a great background. So obviously if you did this, if you wanted to create, um, oh, thanks, thanks Zoe. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to create backgrounds where you had more grunge, well then you would know when you brayer, leave yourself more open space. But this one is a little bit more solid, so you can see uh, that you can create just a little bit on the edge. Or if you leave it a little bit loose or open, you can create a cool effect. Great for, again, you can stamp on this, you can die cut this, you can do so many things with it, but it's a great effect of, 
of using ink and paint. Let's do this one because it was sitting there just calling my name saying, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please use it. Now, I'm still gonna go in with brown, but it could be any color. You could do green, you could do anything over this. But this one has way more open space, so I think it's gonna be fun uh, to create it. So I agree, Arlene, I love, I love the, see, so just imagine not having crushed solid paint. My gosh, well, that's gonna be the case, and it goes back in the vault, but it is what it is. At least now we have the opportunity to get it, so I don't wanna sound like a brat, because I think I've been sounding like a brat to Ranger for these last, probably the last year where I was like, but I want these paints. What, can't we get them? Can't they be permanent? Why can't they stay in the line? But you know what? You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. It goes for me too. So here I'm just going to wipe this off. Yeah, now I like that. I'm going to even add some, just some water directly to this because I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight some of that color and I'm gonna leave some of that drip into the ink. I'll show you what I'm doing in just a second. Let me dry this real quick. Okay. Mm-hmm-hmm. Okay. So what I did here was I inked, just like we did on, on this one. I started wiping it off, but then in these areas, I'm like, uh, I kinda of like some of it, so I'm just gonna do a little splattering and lift it up. So look at that. So see, I got like kind of this effect, almost like an oxidation it looks like, totally changes the dynamic of this background. But let's say you didn't like this. So let's say even after you dried this ink, you say to yourself, you know what, I don't like that, it's too speckly fleckly. It just has ink on it. So distress ink can always be removed. So I can just add a little bit of water and I can, I can still get rid of this. So I can get rid of those speckles and go right down to the paint, no problem. So you can edit that because ink is always water reactive, but my paint, my distress paint layers is permanent. That's the magic of paint. That's really what I hope you guys are grasping throughout this entire demo is the importance of this medium and how these colors really play with everything else that what you do in paint is permanent. So adding ink and removing it and adding ink and removing it, you can do that all day. It's not gonna come off on your hands, but water allows me to take it off, but it will never impact my paint. So could you do this on a piece of fabric? Absolutely. You could brayer this on fabric. You can do all that. Just know that if you're trying to ink the fabric, uh, the ink would wash out totally if you washed it, but the paint, whatever you did with paint on fabric would be permanent. So some really great, great backgrounds for that. Okay. So next up, we'll go, we're going to go back to this one. This is that texture paste one that we did just to show you some, some other uses for that. I uh, actually need to dry this one off real quick. If you don't mind. Oh, thanks. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, what we're gonna do on this one is we're gonna, we're gonna go back and actually put some paint onto that texture paste. So, so there's a question for you. Yes, sure. Spirit wants to know which fabrics are best. Which fabrics are best? Well, free spirit fabrics, <laughs> eclectic elements. No, I think they might be asking really like what surfaces. <laughs> um, and it can be, it can be cotton. I would say is the best canvas or it, it could be even quilting cotton. I probably, if you're gonna deal with like silk or synthetic, I would do alcohol ink for colorant on that. So yeah, any, that was a good one though, Mario. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a stencil and we're gonna place it right back over what we did. So remember this was texture paste. We're gonna put this back. Now I did a technique similar to this, uh, I think it was a couple years ago now for Valentine's Day. We did like conversation hearts, if you guys remember. So this, I think I'll take a, I'll take a brush, a little paint brush. This one will work, I think. Eh, I don't think it's too big. Okay, I'm just gonna pull this off. I just wanna have a palette real quick. So underneath that craft mat is a printed palette. So let me just take some, some colors real quick and just do, do a dot, a dot or two of some colors. Might even do something a little bit, a little bright. And I won't do a full thing. I mean, I'd really like to paint this entire thing, but I also value the, the day and the time. So I'm gonna use a little festive berries. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, a little bit of red. Yeah, it's very much, I saw someone just say like, abandon, very, like that did, that actually reminded me of abandon, that whole inky brayer background. It's kind of cool. Okay, do a little, little bright green, a little citron. And of course I have to do crushed olive and I'm gonna throw in 
a little bit of Lucky Clover. So there's some crushed olive. We're gonna do a little stormy sky. Just gonna kind of create a quick little rainbow. Just so you guys can see. I haven't used this one, we'll use peacock feathers. Peacock feathers isn't retired, so that's good. I think people would, I know I would have a fit if that was retired. A little bit of blueprint sketch. So see, having these little boxes, I don't know, it just, it helps my brain compartmentalize the color palette. Oh, and I also see that I'm missing orange, so I got room off to this. There's another row over here. Yep, and my brain will not let me put orange there. It just won't. I have to put it up here, so <laughs> sorry guys. Oh my I'm putting it over there. I just can't. Look, if you understand your issues and you embrace them, it's a lot easier to get along with yourself. It really is. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a brush and now I'm just going to paint over that texture paste. And uh, I'll just kind of graduate the colors a little bit. So I'll go from one color kind of into the next, you know, do a little bit, do a little bit of a mix. And then uh, I, have a, I have a cloth just hanging off of, off of my belt. So I just kind of clean my brush that way. This is, uh, again, something really important. If you want to, if you want to maintain like vivid, vivid coloration of things, try not to dip your brush in water over and over. So this one, you can see, I kind of went back into the paint just to make a little bit of a, of a brighter red. And even if I'm going into like the next color, like with some orange, this will be a little bit reddish. If you need to clean your brush, of course, clean it. But you know, if you can, if you can avoid doing it as much as possible, I think you'll be happier with, uh, with the results. So here I'm just mixing a little bit of that yellow. So this one, I do want to clean my brush because I want my yellow to be as true as possible. So I'll just pick up some of that wild honey and we're going to go into that. So all I'm doing is I'm, I'm holding the stencil down. The media grip I find is super helpful for this because it just adds a grip. It grips my paper. Uh, it just grips everything that I'm trying to work on without me chasing it down. And I can jump right into Twisted Citron, kind of create that, that brighter green, and then dip a little bit of that into some crushed olive. So it doesn't really take long. I mean, I, I won't paint the whole thing and I know that's gonna drive a lot of people crazy, but I'm, I'm so used to it when I do demos that my, my ideas are a little, a little half-baked. So go into some blue here. It's going to have a little bit of a, a yellow hue to it, so I'll still jump into that. So that almost kind of worked out to be a darker green, so I'm okay with that. But now that I see my colors getting a little muddy, I'll just jump right into the water. And again, I'm just wiping it off on, on a towel. Each time, I'm just wiping uh, as much of that water out as possible. There we go. See a little truer color? It's pretty easy. And we can jump back into this blue, go a little bit darker go into some of that blueprint sketch mixed with it. I think I'll jump back a little bit. Stormy Sky blueprint sketch, it's good. It's kind of a cool, uh, almost like a cadet blue. It's really, really beautiful. Okay, and then we'll go into this. You can just see like color. That's another thing about paint. How fun is that just to, just to jump around and mix from color to color to color? There you go, a little bit of purple and We'll go into as true as we can get. There we go, that should work. There we are. A little bit of that wilted violet at the end. Okay, so I know everyone would be like, oh, you need to finish that. Nope, okay. So here, just gonna throw that back. But the stencil just helps you stay in the lines. <laughs> could you freehand that? Probably most people uh, with skill of a paintbrush could. I, on the other hand, cannot. So um, while that's drying, I'm just gonna I mean, I'm all about cleaning up, but hey, this is kind of something. I don't know what this, this could be a hot mess. No, it's just, so here's the thing. So you see my spray bottle? I'll just tell it, see, keeping it real. So every spray bottle has that little tube thing, right? That tube is always bent in one direction. It's designed to pick up the water. So do you see how mine is coming out the back? So when I go to spray water, Mario's like, do you need water? But clearly I don't because the bottle is full. Well, I, I, mean, if, I can only hear it. Yeah, what you need to do is you see when you take this out, because this was a new sprayer, so that's why I haven't adjusted it. I always like my tube to point in the direction of my sprayer. So I'm gonna hold this and just 
turn this plastic piece to where it does because I don't know about you, but whenever I'm spraying something, and I'll just keep that in that direction, just turn the, whenever I'm spraying, I'm usually tipping my bottle forward. Now my tube is in the juice, whereas before it was always in the air pocket. See that? So, ah, look, now it works. Yeah. So, yeah, just a little something. Yeah, just a little something. You just kind of turn it because sometimes it just happens. So, all right, I'm just going to do like a crazy color print just to see uh, what happens. This one happens to be on watercolor paper. Ooh, I like that. I do. I'm just going to spray it just to kind of get those colors to migrate and do their thing. And we're going to leave it. We're going to set that aside because why not? All right, now I'll take that off. But yeah, just a little tip about that. <laughs> the spray bottle? Oh my gosh. Because yeah, sometimes you just think like, what is wrong with this thing? And then you don't realize that you didn't even look at the tube and the tube is going the wrong way. So one, and once you adjust it, you never have to adjust it again. It's just sometimes you'll buy it and you never have to adjust it because, you know, it was installed going the right way. And sometimes just by luck, it wasn't. Okay, I'm going to clean off that little space. I'm going to dry that space and I'm going to put my mat right back down. Again, this is a silicone backed mat, so it just grips right onto that glass. Okay, so here's what we have. We're going to dry that. See, it's the little tips that you don't even know, you didn't know that you needed to know, but now you know, you know. Okay, there we go. I'm going to dry put some water down there. Okay. So we have some options on this. One thing to know about texture paste is that texture paste, especially the opaque, is designed to absorb color. So if you go and put ink or something on here now, uh, that ink will actually want to absorb into that texture paste from the side. So what I would suggest for this technique is just get yourself some collage medium, uh, some gel medium, whatever, uh, and just go over that paint, okay? If you don't want to use your fingers, you can use a brush. So I'm just going right over those circles, just with a little bit of collage medium. Not a lot, I'm doing it to where it kind of starting to feel tacky, and I just wanna make sure that that area is covered. Okay, perfect. Then I'm gonna put the lid right back on that, and I'm gonna clean off my fingers while it's wet. This way it doesn't dry kind of crusty or sticky. Okay, so what we've done is we have painted and sealed this top area. Collage medium has a drying time of now. <laughs> Kelly just fixed her spray bottle. It, you're, it's going to be happiness, right? I'm telling you right now, it'll be pure happiness. Okay. So I'm just going to dry this because I want this to be dry to the touch like any other medium. Just touch it. See, it felt a little, see, that little sticky. That means it's not totally dry. Almost, but not totally dry. And I'm going to show you what's really important about uh, how that, where is the unlock on the spray bottle? Right here in the neck, you see that little button that's got, it's got a little picture of a lock and it says the word lock. So if you push that, now your spray bottle is locked. On the other side where it says unlock and the little lock is open, you push that and now it's unlocked. So if you're traveling, you can lock it so it doesn't misfire in your bag and you push it that way. So it's that little toggle switch with the picture uh, and the lock and unlock. So there you go. Because, yeah, if you're spraying and it's clicking away, it's locked. And chances are, most likely might be broken by now, too, but uh, locked. Okay, so this we have paint and collage medium. This side, I didn't do anything because I want to show you uh, something really important about texture paste. If we add color to this side, anything untreated, this is going to absorb the color. But because we added paint and collage medium, we can do some really fun things with the paint and its vibrancy. So I'm going to take a distressed crayon. Now... A crayon is nice. This is a, a water reactive pigment and I'm just going to add some crayon and I'm going to smudge it, but I, I want to get this pretty water reactive pigment means I can just take a wet finger and really make this stuff move. Okay. And it doesn't have to be brown, but you, if you've watched any of my demos, I love to live in a world of brown. I do. I love vintage. See now this finger doesn't want to be part of the party. Okay. And I'm just moving that crayon around. If you find the smudging hard to do, that's when you dip your finger in some water and that will just help that move around even more. If you don't want to put any color on there, you can just put a little bit on that mat. See, I can wet that up and then I can add some 
some color in. I often find that it's, it is best to add it directly to the surface. You just get more, more of that cool grunge buildup by scribbling some of that, you know, on that surface. Okay. So here's what we've got. Let's move a little bit there. Excellent. So now I've got these kind of grungy <laughs> circles, if you will, where I've added the crayon. Now the collage medium is what made this crayon move on this paper. So see under there, all the movement. This part that I didn't do any sealing to, I'll just do the same idea with the crayon just to show you that if the paper is not sealed, everything is going to soak in. Done. Like that movement, that's not happening. It can't. And you're going to be like, but wait a minute, you just did the crayon and you did all the dance. Yeah, but the difference was this had paint on it and collage medium, which sealed it. This did not, which made it porous. This paper had a layer of collage medium, which allowed that color to move because it was sealed. This was not. So if you like this look, great. But if you want that more collage kind of a mixed up look, that's where having different mediums like collage medium, because it dries matte, dries just like the paper, it makes your surface completely permanent and waterproof. And so now I'm just doing another one more layer of smudge. And then I'm going to reveal because I like the color. It wasn't like I was trying to cover up the color. I was just trying to show you something else to do with paint. That's really, really fun to work with. Okay. So we have our layer of texture paste. We'll, we'll kind of do a little rewind. We added that through a stencil, let it dry. Then we went in with colors of paint let it dry. Then we went in with a light layer of collage medium with our finger, let it dry. Then we went over with crayon, a little bit of water, learned about the sprayer, moved it around, let it dry. So that crayon is fairly dry. It's kind of tacky, but whether it was tacky or dry, you can still do this next part. Now we're going to go in and we're going to reveal those dots again. So I'll go back to water. It works so much better now, Mario. Thank you for calling that out. And now I'm just going to, to go in and just start wiping this off. It could take some off from the background, depending on how hard you press. Um, but you can also go back and add some more grunge later if you want. But take a look at that. Perfectly grunged, colorful circles. So any part that you, and I'll just do a little close up. I'll try. Uh, see, I can just take off that crayon with just with some damp, uh, damp paper towel. So you can bring up as much color as you want. Um, you can also uh, leave some of that grunge there. Like you don't have to clean it off, but that's what I love about the texture paste. It creates that texture where the brown likes to live. But what a great, fun, colorful background. Oh, I love it. Uh, great. Again, texture paste stays totally pliable. So even after it's dry, it's completely flexible. But what a fun background to use on so many things, die cuts, cards, whatever. But the intensity of that color is because of paint. And you see the transition of paint. I mean, that's why I didn't want to have it kind of pre-painted. I know some people are bored by the color, but the other thing that's super important is just understanding that, you know, if you put your colors in order, it's much easier to kind of create that, that transition or that fade with another color. Right. So you have that lightest color. In fact, I want that pink to even be, I can see that that pink still is a little dirty and that was our, our light spun sugar. So I'm just going to go in and clean it off, make it a little bit brighter. Look at that. See, and you can do this anytime with the crayon. That's, that's what I love about it. So I can even dab just some spots, but I always like to keep some grunge. Let's say you wiped off too much. Could you go back and put crayon over the whole thing and do it again? Absolutely. You can do this process, color and lift, color and lift indefinitely. It's fun. And knowing different mediums, that's again why these lives are so important. I understand that they are overwhelming. I read the comments and some people say, it's so overwhelming, it's so much information. And I agree, but sometimes, and so I'm not, I'm not judging anybody's video style. My style, I love live. I love not really having a plan and throwing it together because to me, it's you can navigate your products better. If I just showed you paint, and I didn't put any other products in the mix. I didn't bring in sprays or texture or collage medium. You wouldn't know that paint works with everything else you already have. And so while I understand that sometimes it seems like a lot of information, this is a video that, that will have timestamps once it is um, done through with YouTube. That's the other thing people ask about captions and subtitles. Those are auto generated from YouTube. And sometimes it could take a couple of days from the, the ending of a live stream 
before the uh, subtitles and captions populate. So just please be patient. Um, you know, some people are just not super kind when they leave comments because they're very assumptive of things. But the reality is it's, it's YouTube and they will process it when they process it and it will be there. Uh, and just like timestamps, we have to wait for YouTube to kind of clear it, uh, make sure there's no you know, bad words or anything, and then we could add timestamps. But the timestamps in a video, when you go to YouTube, if you click the word that says more, it'll bring up all these categories that I cover. So if you just wanna see this one, this might be covered like texture paste with paint. You can click that time and it'll take you right to this demo. You don't have to find it in a two, three hour live stream. That's really been the nice thing of, of adding timestamps. So that's why I like to do it. I think it's, it's more important if you kind of connect the dots a little bit, right? Okay, so let's, let's just talk about a couple of other surfaces or substrates and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up with paint. But hey, so far so good, right? I think it's, hope you guys are learning some stuff. I hope, hope you're having fun. Okay. So when it comes to paint, you can use paint over many different things. You can use it over textures. So we talk about uh, textured paper and or embossing folders. So let me find my paper. I know I took it out, so I'm not even gonna ask Mario to look for it. No, I'm not even gonna ask. Although I might end up asking. I had it here. It was some textured paper that I had and I put it in a really safe spot. That's okay, I'll find it. I will. That's I will. The best thing about a safe spot. Oh, there it is. It's in, it's in a tin that I have with the idea of the tin in my head with the thing and the bits. This texture paper over there. Oh, no, I got it. No, I don't. That Where? Pile? Oh, there it is. See? Yeah. I, kept, I kept it on the table. I know where everything Thanks, is. Thanks, Mario. <laughs> Mario knows where everything And here's the reason. Because I did this just three minutes before we went this live. Is the okay, way. this is how it is. Textured paper. Paint and textured paper is super fun because, you know, working on uh, all of these things is really, really important to know that you can take your embossing folders and you can do all sorts of cool things with, with your textured paper. And textured paper also allows you to modify the finish of something. So, for example, uh, metallics right we could take metallic cardstock and we can change it this is just done with paint this is done with paint over black so it gives it a really cool finish i can demo that but if you have something textured like a wood grain paper we can take a wood grain and we could uh, quickly add some color i'll take a, an ink pad i'll smash it down there's a little distress ink uh, over here i've got some spray so i'm just going to take a little uh, oxide spray let's spray some oxide right into that mix why not just add a little, just a little evergreen bow. That could be a, a fun effect. Uh, and then maybe, maybe I'll add, ooh, I think I'll add a little bit of Uncharted Mariner. Not much, but probably just a little. There we go, just a little splash. So that's some ink and some sprays. And this is Distress Wood Grain Cardstock, but this could be something you embossed with a, an embossing folder. We're just gonna add some color to this, just real quick. Just throwing some of that on there. Don't worry, we're going to build some layers, but just adding, adding some effect. I can tell right now I'm going to want some more brown. So I'll just take a spray stain. Could, it, could I have used the ink pad again? Yes. But when you have spray stain and you kind of know what you know, you know the intensity of it, we're going in with that. Okay, and I'll take some of that. See, so look at the difference. Wow. Okay. I'm just going to add a little bit of water just to kind of create some movement. Go back in. I'm just adding some color just so you can see when you're, when you're using ink over something embossed. Now this could be done before or after the fact, but I think the, the important thing to remember on certain textures, because now we have wood grain cardstock and crack leather cardstock and so many cool different uh, papers. Add a little bit of brown in this corner. See, now I'm like doing a little, little creative placement. There we are. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit of water just to fill in the blanks. Okay, um, when you have something really, really minimal like wood grain, sometimes color just confuses your eye from texture. And I learned this, this tip from Stacy, and I thought it was really good. It was a great use for paint in a brayer because I remember uh, seeing her do this on one of her tutorials. And I'm like, how did you get that, that wood grain to look so real? It was so cool. So this one is really good. Okay. Um, Beautiful, 
Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I just saw a comment that said, are you afraid to use pink? It's always brown. Well, I guess not, you know, because I don't know. That's pink. That's pink. That's pink. That's pink. So fear, no. Comfort, yes. You do what you like. If you use what you like, you're happier. If you use what other people expect you to, then not so happy. So I definitely prefer to stay in my little happy world. But as long as you understand the product, you can choose whatever color makes you happy. So now that I have this dried, this is my texture. And my texture is still there. It didn't get rid of that wood grain texture, but it's not nearly as visible. So what I'm going to do is take some paint. And I think, again, I'll use a good friend, old paper. Did add just a little bit of that paint. And what we want to do on this one is take our brayer, but we want to put this paint on as thin as possible. Okay, there we go. So you can see that I'm brayering through my paint, but I'm also using the craft mat to kind of get a really thin, thin layer because we want to do this with uh, as little bit of pressure as possible. We can go back and do many, many layers of this, but I'm just taking that paint and just brayering it over that texture. And you'll see that as you do that, that wood grain will start to just be way more visible and our background becomes way more subtle. Look at that. So you see the highlights? So could that be any color? Could it be a darker color? Sure, it could be whatever you want, but the paint, because of its viscosity, sits over the top and creates such a beautiful finished effect that really highlights the detail of that paper. I think that's the, the cool thing about any type of texture, especially something thin, is using a brayer and a little bit of paint. Again, it could be, it could have been, uh, stormy sky, weathered wood, it could be anything like that. I'm just gonna use this real quick just because uh, it's old paper. Um, that you can use really any kind of color that you, you want to put on. This is just really wet, mucky paint. I'm just gonna create that background just to set aside because I like old paper. Okay, so, so far, so good. If you have something metallic while we're talking textures, Metallic, you don't necessarily need to use a brayer, but metallic is quite fun because when you work with metallic cardstocks, you can create some beautiful, beautiful finishes with some paint, which lets me talk about black paint in particular. Oh, I hope I have some backgrounds that are not painted yet. I don't know, I have to look. Do I have any over there, Mark? <laughs> Let me look. I know I have some guys, because I did some. Okay, they're not there, they're not there. Maybe they're here. Let's see, are they here? Nope, are they in here? Maybe, I could have sworn I did some. Uh, gosh, I have every other background under the sun. Okay, I'll get there. Let me flip through here. Backgrounds, backgrounds, backgrounds. <laughs> I literally just did them just before the live. Did I leave it on the table? Oh my word, you guys. I just put it in a safe spot and that's my problem. Oh, uh, here it is. It's so, it's so safe that I kind of don't really know uh, where I like to set stuff. Okay. I do. I have piles of stuff safe everywhere. Spots, they are the worst. Well, I think any maker can relate when you say to yourself, I'm going to put it in a safe spot. Then you don't know where that spot is. So it's only safe to the thing hiding. It's not safe to you for finding it. Is it? You're the devil. Yeah. It's the craziest thing about, what, uh, now what? Finding a space. No, no, no. I just, I'm just clearing up some, clearing up some space. Okay. So for backgrounds, especially metallic backgrounds, you can take a background that starts out quite mucky. And I do want to show you that because I think, I think it's important to understand that, that certain backgrounds do different things. You can have backgrounds that have really great detail. They can start out really clean, but you can transform them. Look at that metallic one. Beautiful. Um, with just a little bit of paint. But the thing about the paint that you have to remember uh, is that not all paint viscosity is like I said at the beginning, here's another texture one, like that would be good with paint. Um, I just, I, I knew I had a tin of embossing because when I do something, I've told you all the time, I just do it in repetition. So if I'm embossing paper, I'll just take sheets of paper and I have that folder and I just go, go, go. Because to me, it, it saves time in the end. Well, only if you could find it, but I just found my tin. That was my other tin. That's where I use that storage tin for my backgrounds. Okay. 
The cool thing about this is that you can take a background and you can go from this to this with paint. So it's a, it, this is exactly the same background. This is on craft uh, metallic because there is a metallic version of the craft stock, but it could be any kind of metallic paper that you want, or it could be adhesive. It could be all sorts of things. But I want to talk about the black paint because black paint for a lot of people in the distress line is a love and hate relationship. And if you hate it, then it's on me because this is how I wanted this black paint to be. To me, black paint, because it's black, it's not really that uh, significant in, in the paint world, but I wanted something that would really work as like this, this India ink, if you will, this really dark black stain that you can use for a thing. So black is the thinnest of all paints. It's almost like water. It's like just black ink or black water. So when you go to use it and you go to pour it out, it's just gonna drip out and you're gonna be like, why isn't this thick? It's just because how I wanted this formulated because I wanted to be able to use it almost as an antiquing uh, agent. So I'm gonna shake it up and I will drip it over something metallic so you can see it's, it's incredibly fluid. See that? Okay. That's important because when, if, you, if you're new to it, you're gonna open it and be like, what is going on? Um, next I'll take, well, you could take a blending tool, you could take your finger, you can do whatever you want and you're just gonna mix it around. So again, you can use a blending tool, but what I wanna do is I wanna get that paint into the areas of my embossing. So if a brush works, great, but the pads of my finger are gonna work just fine and I just wanna move this paint around, okay? Need a little bit more because I want to make sure that it's got some areas built up in the background. Now paint, although it is a, a permanent medium, it will wash off with soap and water from your, from your hands. So just going to clean this off. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want this paint to be like dry, but not totally dry. So see paint gone, clean it while it's wet. All right. We can let it air dry or we can use a heat tool. But if you use a heat tool, you kind of want to be, you want to be careful. We don't want this to dry all the way. If it dries all the way, it's, it's game over because it'll be permanent. So just a little bit with the heat tool and you can see that the paint is still really wet. What you're going to do is take something dry, dry paper towel usually works. And you just start kind of, there we go. We're just going to start burnishing that paint with a paper towel. So ultimately we're leaving some of that paint that's on the surface in the areas, but we're removing the stuff from the top area. Again, just a dry paper towel, burnish, burnish. You could even go in and burnish with your fingers. That's going to take off uh, even lighter layer. If you want some areas to really shine and take a look at that, like look at how cool that paint just totally transforms that piece of paper to now have a very cool, grungy uh, vintage, look to that paper. Now you can cut that up. You can do all sorts of things with uh, working with an embossing folder, but that's just using metallic and black paint. Okay. That to me is, is an important thing to, to note that black paint is designed to be fluid. It's also meant for splattering because I wanted it that perfect viscosity that if you wanted to go in with a splatter brush, you could go in and just splatter that black paint uh, without thinning it out. Okay. Moving on. We're in the home stretch here. Gosh, so many things. So many things. You guys are funny in the chat. I've been trying to watch and I love how uh, you're engaging and also, you know, coming up with ideas or, or hopefully learning some new things about paint or being reminded of things maybe you saw before with paint. But I think distress paint makes it pretty, pretty magical. It okay. Magic. It is magic. All right. We're going to do a road of metallic next. So for those that have seen this demo, you know that even when I do it, I kind of break a little bit of a sweat every time because this is that one technique that you could do it a hundred times and it doesn't mean it's always going to work, but when it does work, it is magic. Okay. So here's what we're going to work with for eroded metallic. What this technique will ultimately do is it will create, and I actually have some samples shockingly enough. Um, it's going to create an effect of almost like a patina or oxidized metal. It's the coloration. This is an embossing folder, but it's going to change the surface. Uh, and make it look like patinaed metal with paint. You ready? Because now I think as students, you guys know everything you know. Like this is that same folder we just did. And the paper started out as just 
plain mixed media paper, but see how it looks like patinaed copper? Okay, get ready, here we go. So this is what will ultimately apply, and this could be any kind of paper. I prefer to use mixed media. Now mixed media doesn't just come in tags. You can also get uh, mixed media heavy stock in sheets. It's just a great paper because it is designed to, to be very uh, resilient to wet and dry, wet and dry, wet and dry. So it's even more resilient than watercolor because uh, of its surface that's over the top of it. And that's what these tags are made out of. They're made out of this mixed media heavy stock paper. But I'll just do a tag because I've already talked about how it makes it really easy to do. So what we need as far as the ingredients, our surface, we're gonna need whatever colors of paint that we wanna use for our patina. In this case, I wanna use a little bit of crushed olive because that's gonna be a great green. That's why I've, I've missed it so much. I want a little tumbled glass because I want a little bit of a light blue uh, to my patina. Uh, and then I'll take a little bit of peacock feathers because that's gonna give me a little turquoise. So two of these are uh, from the vault color. So you can see why I was just, uh, just sobbing away that they weren't. And then this one is a, a current one. And then we're gonna take a metallic. Now Distress comes in three metallics. It comes in uh, antique bronze, tarnish, or brushed pewter and tarnished brass. So it's essentially kind of a vintage gold, silver, and copper. These are a totally different dynamic to all these other paints. And it's because they're so different in their formulation that this technique works. I cannot get this technique to work color on color the same way I can get it to work with metallic over a color. You'll see what I mean in just a minute, okay? So I'm gonna use bronze because I want it to be kind of bronze or coppery. So those are my ingredients. So far, so good. You guys, you guys with me? Then what you need is you're going to need a dry paper towel at the ready. So you can't even have time to kind of find it and fumble it. And then you're just gonna want something to put your paint down. That could be a brush, it could be a blending tool, it could be really, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you wanna apply. So I'm gonna want a wide brush for my metallic. So I'm gonna have that ready. And then I can use whatever I want for my background colors of paint. And I think for that, I'll probably just use this blending tool just because I have it. Okay, so let's get started. We're gonna shakety shake up these colors because we're gonna use these colors to apply our patina foundation. And this is going to be over the entire tag. So I'll take these colors and I don't mind that these colors are gonna mix a little bit. So I'll take, there's a little bit of tumbled glass. We're gonna take a little bit of peacock feathers. It does not have to be these colors either. If you like your patina more green, use other greens, use peeled paint, twisted citron, um, any colors. In fact, I think I'm even gonna throw in just a touch a forest moss because I do love that dark green color. I always like to have a couple of versions of, of colors that are down here. Okay, so that's just gonna be a, a starting point. So I'll just take, and I'm just gonna take a brush. Again, it could be, oh, I just used my brush for my metallic. Why? Because it was sitting right here. That's okay, I'll clean it in the meantime. I, I did have this, but see how this rolled to here and this was here and my eye goes, that's the tool. No, denied. Uh, no, I have to, I'm using it first, so I think so. See, that's how it is. We know, makers makers get. But I'll show you why I'm gonna use a blending tool because this to me is like a hot mess. There you go, Mario, thank you. Sure. So here's what I love about working with a blending tool. Watch, watch the difference in my patina. My patina won't look like a Picasso painted it. What it's gonna look like is more of a modeled look and that's why I think that this tool is better because see how I can put some blue up in there, I can bring some green down in there, I can add some green. So it's just more organic, and that's ultimately what we want uh, our background to be because I, I used up so much, I need some more tumbled glass. There we go. All right, my popcorn brain, it's just, I, I'm not much of a, I don't overthink. I'm sure you guys can witness that firsthand. Uh, thinking is overrated, so I just, I'm very reactive. Uh, and that's, that's good or bad, yeah. So it's like, oh, that's there, I'm using it. But you know, then ultimately, you, Kind of look back and you shouldn't have. Okay, so I've got some color down. I probably want to put a little bit more blue up there. So I'm gonna just add a little bit more peacock feather. So I think on this patina, I probably wanted it more uh, blue heavy, a little tumbled glass as well. Cause I think that tumbled glass just adds such a nice uh, brightness to it. And I'm just gonna want to make sure that I have that color. You see, kind of blotting it over there. This way I can just tap down some of that color. There we go. Just to, just to bring in a little bit more of those bluey vibes in certain areas. Because the, the thing about this technique, you can plan this background all you want. 
you're going to get what you get. You'll see exactly what I mean. So don't overthink this part as far as how it looks just about real estate for color. Meaning if you want more, more potential blue to show up, make sure you have more blue areas or, or vice versa if it's green or whatever. Okay. So next I'm just going to clean this up. Just want to get rid of this. This is already done and we're going to dry it. So once you get the paint down, don't worry about it. I can just take that, get rid of this because it's the next part that's ultimately going to be the most important. This part was just laying a foundation. You could take your time uh, choosing your colors, but just don't overthink this layer, you guys, because you're going to cover this up 100%, 100%. Okay, so we're just going to dry it. Yeah, distress paints, like I told you, they work like an ink. Because they don't have the filler, you just don't get mud. Even though we're throwing in green, and this isn't mud, by the way, this is forest moss. That's what I love about it. It's such a great green. It's like a, just a dark, dark, uh, dirty green. And I love it. So I want this to be dry. Does it have to be heat set? No, it just has to be dry to the touch. There we are. Okay. Yeah, you found some distress paint dabbers. So yeah, you can just buy uh, flip tops in a, in a pack. Some places even sell it bulk and you can replace them. So the flip tops are sold, I think, in a, maybe a three pack, but I've even seen places sell it in a, like a 25 pack or a 50 pack. So something to keep in mind. Okay, I want this to be completely dry. So, so important to be super dry. Okay, meaning when you're touching it, it's not wet at all. It's completely dry. Beautiful background though, right? Okay, here's where things are like, get ready, pay attention. We need metallic paint something to apply it as quick as possible. Uh, in fact, in now that I see this off to the side, I'm going to switch brushes because I even want to go for a bigger brush. Dina has uh, bigger brushes, but I think I even want to go with something possibly bigger. So I'm going to take this brush. I also know, I mean, you saw from the beginning, I love that a collage brush is a little wider, but really you can use any brush. So I've got a brush, metallic, paper towel, and my water. Are you guys ready? So here's what we need to do. This is dry. We need to apply this paint while this paint is wet, while it's wet. We need to add water to it to keep it wet. Then we're gonna dry it and then we're gonna reveal. Okay, so it's very, very different. So I'm gonna shake it all up. I don't know if anyone that's done this technique before, it is a bit of a, you kind of, you get a little panicky, but that's okay. So I wanna put down enough paint that hopefully I'll have enough to cover my tag. If not, I can probably quickly grab it, but uh, don't put it away because if you need it, just want it at the ready. Here we go. I'm going to take this. And in fact, because I make a big, bit of a mess on this one, I'm gonna take a piece of, you could take deli paper or paper towel, whatever. This one gets a little bit messier because we're painting everyone. We gotta get metallic paint down. So here we go. I'm gonna take that metallic paint and I'm just going to quickly apply it to the entire thing. So this is why I said you need a brush that you can quickly put paint on. Then without hesitation, you're gonna start going in with water. And what you wanna do is I wanna to try to drip the water on, okay? I wanna create like droplets, movement, big areas, small areas, concentrated areas. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, I can't really pick it up, but it's got like a lot of water and some drips here. Then I wanna go in and dry it, okay? So essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm drying where there isn't water. Once I see that paint is dry, I'm going to take my paper towel. I'm gonna to place this over the top, dab that down, and we're going to peel this back for the reveal. What? So here is what happens, okay? What's cool about this technique is what happened was is that our base is our patina got it, dried. Our top coat was metallic. And while that was wet, we added a significant amount of water to keep the wet paint wet. And then we went in and dried the rest of the paint. We can't have all the paint wet, so we can't miss the whole thing because then the paint won't ever dry. So wherever the water was, it stayed wet enough that even though I used a heat tool, it didn't dry it but wherever there was no water or very minimal amount of water, it dried this metallic paint. So this way, when I laid the paper towel down, it absorbed any of that, wa that water. You couldn't go in and wipe it because you would have essentially smeared the metallic paint everywhere. You wanted to just absorb 
that layer. So wherever that water was, you can see like that matches that. You guys see that? Okay. So once it's done, it is, it's done. You get what you get. You can't go back and take off any more. It's, it's just done. This we're just going to throw in the water. This one, and I've done this technique for a bazillion years. So, you know, you might be like, oh, you made it look easy. Well, there's been many, Sometimes many years that it didn't, you know, because there was a fan going or I got distracted or whatever. Okay, so now I want to dry it because we're not totally done with it. It looks cool, but I think it's going to look better in a minute. So now I want to dry this because, so what's cool about this is essentially you're making metallic paper. So now if you have a die cut, it's going to look like metal. If you do a journal cover, it's going to look like metal. If you use a picture frame, it's going to look like metal. If you do pages, it's going to look like metal because, well, it looks like metal. And you can do these with different colors. It could be brass. It could be silver. It could be black. It could be any colors. You could have pink and purple under there if you want. But this is our finished tag to start. It's painted. It's dry. But things are going to get better because when we build off of everything we've learned during this demo, we know all the things we can combine, right? So we already know that ink over paint creates some amazing, amazing things. So I'm going to take an ink pad. Again, let me just get a little grip there because I really like to pick up a lot of color. And I'm going to saturate this with ink. So instead of doing a traditional blend, you know that, I am just juicing it up. Could you go direct to pad? Yes, but that's probably more ink than you need. But that's okay. But I want to make sure that I'm putting on a good amount of ink. It could be any color ink. Uh, just having to have walnut stain here, but it could be vintage photo, gathered twigs. It could be, yes, it could be because I was just thinking, do I have a gathered twigs here? No, I have walnut. This is fine. Any color is going to work. Okay. So now we've inked the whole thing. Just squished it down. Don't worry about anything. Just squish it down. But now we know that ink over paint could either dry because we remember we've done stamp resist, all that same exact properties. But now we're just going to take our water and we're going to add some more drips. It's all about kind of learning, learning the spray bottle and kind of becoming friends with it. Okay. Leave that on for a second. Use our heat tool because we know that a heat tool is going to create outlines of our inks. Correct. We know from seeing it a few times, Take a paper towel again, a different one, and same idea. We're going to place that over the top and we're going to remove this. Now, as you do this, we want this layer to dry. The drying is what's going to bring everything into focus. <laughs> You're right, it could be any brown you want. Um, so here's what we've got. Now take a look at the difference. What? Come what? on. Come on. So what happened here is that was our original base color, those bright colors. The brown toned everything down. The water revealed that light color. So if I wanted to, say, remove some of the color, could I just take, just like we did stamp resist, could I spray my paper towel and could I go and lift this off? Yes, you can see that. It, it takes it right back to that metallic. But adding some drips of water and lifting it off it just creates more of a oxidation. If I want more of that color to kind of show, so look, I'll just drip some water right in that spot so you can see it. Dry it for a second, because that's what's going to create this effect. And then I'll blot this off. See, now I brought back that color because I wanted more of that highlight color. I didn't want all that grayish color. I like that, but you can reveal it because why? It's paint. Paint is permanent when it's dry. So that blue and green layer didn't move when we added the metallic. The metallic and blue layer didn't move when we added the ink. And then it didn't move even though we just added water two more times because paint is a distressed product that is permanent when dry. Makes it magical. Isn't that fabulous? It's so, so cool just to see that you took a piece of paper and you made it metallic. You took one, you embossed it and then added a little bit. This one has a little crayon over the top. Uh, just like when we did those circles, Distressed Crayon gave me a little bit more movement because I wouldn't have done it for this one. You don't antique it with black paint like you did this one because this was paint on printed metallic paper. If you do paint on paint, it's painted. So this one, you have to go in with crayon like we did on the circles, which seem to have evaded me right in this moment. Oh, there it is. I threw it in a pile that I would see. Okay, one more thing and then we're going to wrap this up. 
because we have all these backgrounds that I can kind of show you and, and review. Uh, and this really is just showing you some things. Paints work on other things, and I wanted to remind you that uh, they do some really great things on uh, different surfaces. So there's been makes that you have seen uh, over time if you watch the lives, and just to kind of point out where there's makes. So this one, this is the black paint technique on foil tape, metal foil tape, Ranger Cells foil tape. It's kind of like flashing tape. This is over a styrofoam heart, but this is showing you how to industrialize silver metal or aluminum foil with black paint that's been embossed. It was no different than this exact technique, but instead of it being metallic paper, it was metallic foil. So that was done with black paint. This one for ideology, this was done with paint. So it makes it look like an old grungy clipboard because these start out pretty new, but that's done with paint. Also paint down here, a little bit of paint on there and you wipe it off. Paint rubbed off. This car was a little bit more silver. So I just added some blue paint and wiped it off. Also paint on that entomology charm in there. So this cabinet of curiosities paint, the pointy finger back there, that's a figure stand. Paint the top hat. That was silver. It was it's chippy black paint. So there was a lot of distress paint used on things uh, because working with paint on different substrates makes it really easy to antique. Paula created this fabulous piece. I think this was two years ago when these pieces came out. What a great make this is, isn't it? I love it. So great that I asked her if I could keep it. Uh, it's hanging in my studio. But all of these embellishments, these are ideology embellishments, and these all start, you know, in a cool antique silver. It has a great antique silver uh, color. But paint totally changes it. Adding some paint on there and wiping it off creates a cool effect because this paint is permanent when dry and it's excellent on metal. So you paint it on and wipe it off just like the metallic cardstock. So all of these pieces that just look so grungy and vintage, right? The little frame, uh, even the, the word plaque, that's all just painted and then wiped away. And then even she did some paint splattering as well. So very cool things to know about uh, what paint can do on, on different pieces, especially on metallics. Around Christmas time, we have these little salvaged pieces. These, these start out as a, a white resin, kind of an off-white resin. This is distress paint. So this is distress paint painted on like this plastic and then a little bit of crayon. Rochelle created this technique. I love these. Uh, so painted with distress paint, let it dry, a little hickory smoke crayon, uh, wipe off some excess and then some rock candy glitter to give it that great little vintage sparkle. But a cool thing because what other distress medium can you do on plastic and metal that will stay? Well, nothing other than glaze. So uh, the paint really gives things a, a great timeless, timeless look. And I just wanted to share those, those features because when you see how versatile distress paints are, not just in uh, what they can be adhered to, but also uh, all of these incredible backgrounds. I think that that's just really beautiful. Someone said, please show us how to paint metal. Okay, it will be just like the cardstock, but happy to show you because we're in demo time. I'm gonna take a little bit of old paper for this one. And I'm also gonna take a little bit of Stormy Sky. Now you could do ice spruce, you could do weathered wood, you can do uh, a lot of different, whatever colors you want. But I'll just start with this. You can do your fingers or a brush. It just depends on how, how much you wanna kinda of get into the surface. So I'm just dabbing some of this on. I'm gonna go back into some blue. So I'm just painting onto this metal. There's that metal charm. And then we'll do the same thing with this word plaque. So everything you know about paint that we've done in this demo, which is while it's wet, you do whatever you want, but once it dries, it's permanent. So if we went in right now and just started rubbing this, you're just mixing the paint together. That's not gonna do anything. So what you need to do is just like on all the other techniques, you wanna find that sweet spot where the paint is just starting to dry. So I'm just gonna use a heat tool so the thing about metal, metal gets hot really quick. And once it gets hot, your paint will dry. So I just want to make sure that the metal is a little hot. So the paint starts to set up a little bit quicker. And then all you'll do is just, yeah, you just start kind of feeling it and you'll feel that it starts to get tacky. And then you can use your fingers here. I'm just going to use uh, the backside of a paper towel. And I'm just going to wipe, <laughs> I'm just going to wipe this back and forth so I can start wiping off those raised letters. So see how those letters stay metallic, but the paint is in the recessed areas. Same thing on this charm. I'm just going to uh, go in with a dry paper towel 
and you just start burnishing that metal, that area. And if you wipe off too much paint, you can put more back on. Um, if you want more uh, silver to show, give it just a second. I'm gonna dry it just a little bit more. And same thing, just like what we did with resist. If the paint, if you want the paint to be completely gone while it's wet, go in with a little bit of water. So here you can see that the silver is very cool, but it's kind of like, I don't know, a little hazy. So now I'm just gonna lightly go over this with a damp cloth. And now you'll see that I'm bringing out that shine just on some of those high points. So it's a, like a beautiful, beautiful way that you can antique the metal. So I'm gonna dry this one completely. Someone asked about the, the bracelet. Yeah, this is all my uh, jewelry that I do for Joanne. It's called assemblage. I don't know if it's been retired though. I think the ruler bracelet and the, the black one is, is either retired or being retired. But So this one, so now that's all painted, I could take this a step further and you could add alcohol ink or I'm gonna do some crayon, I think. I think that'd be cool if I could find the silly crayon. Okay. All right, Holtz. Can you believe this mess? This is the this is a crafter math, guys. If no, you guys you saw this, uh, I had a brown crayon, but I can't seem to. How weird is that? Literally use it on the circles. Did it fall? No, but I probably put it in my. Oh, did it fall? You know what? It probably did. Yeah, probably. Probably fell into the trash. No? That's all right. <laughs> we we. Uh, here, let me just, I'll grab another one because I have a whole tin of them and I know I grabbed more than one brown. There we go. I'll just take this one. So for this, I'm just going to take a crayon. We're going to add uh, a little bit of brown just to some areas because see crayon has like this cool ability to like smudge. So I don't want to get it totally in there on the blue, but I want to add some, just some grungy areas. So see how I've started to grunge up that metal. Then I'll go back to uh, that paper towel and just wipe a little bit away. Just fun. So yeah, doing metal. Metal is just like uh, doing any other kind of backgrounds. You can add and lift and add and lift. So look at this one. Now it just gave it so much more of, a, of an oxidized finish. Hard to believe that it just starts out as like a silver piece of metal and how you can make it look so oxidized with just distressed products that you have. So that my friends really is the magic of distress paint and I, I couldn't be happier with uh, all the different things that that it can do because it's really incredible to yeah there there I don't have a second camera intentionally because someone said it'd be fun to have a second camera no way because the stuff that's on back here it is chaos but I like that it's how I like to work I like to pile up the chaos before the demo and I like to be in the chaos but just to kind of show you here we go we've got uh, some painted things we'll take a a walk down tutorial lane. Hard to believe we packed all this stuff in in this live, right? So we've got, there's our eroded metallic that we did. There's kind of our our time-worn metallic. I do love both of these resists. How beautiful were those, right? Stamped resist and then a little bit of watercolor and then this one with the flower. So good, so beautiful. We have this one on texture paste with all those colors. Ooh, so good. Then we have kind of those different brayering and resisting and lifting. I like this one. So this one now I can ink the whole tag and you know that this is going to take ink and this will resist. So that's why I chose to do that one little spot and I'll probably finish that one uh, before I photograph it. So those are all fun, just kind of using resist. Then of course we did these glorious marbling backgrounds. And then of course, what started it all, the, the first three with that brown, but you see that one brown gathered twigs how magical it is as a paint uh, because one color achieved all three of these just by how much water we added and how it, it just got to kind of drip and and do its thing so yeah 